Mr. Chair. Uh, so I'm just going to simply introduce uh, the Director of Veteran Services we have, uh, Jeffrey Chungle. I'm not sure if all of you have had a chance to meet him. Jeff's been on board for how long now? A year and a half? Just a little over a year. A little over a year. Uh, just done a lot of great work since he's been on board, and I'm going to ask him to just describe uh, the need for the transfer and talk a little bit about uh, his work in the office. Good evening. Um, welcome. Uh, it's nice to be here. Nice to finally see some faces. I know I've spoken to a few of you on the phone, so uh, thank you. So we are seeking some additional funds to cover our budget for this year, uh, and they relate to Chapter 115, the state level veterans benefits. So these are our benefits that we provide. They're means based. So. Um, so once I sit down with, with people, we review their finances, determine whether or not they're eligible for certain benefits. And if they are, then, then we enroll them in the program. So um, in addition to that, we provide additional services looking for additional funding, benefits, resources that would be available for veterans from either additional state programs or federal uh, VA pensions. So what we're looking at, uh, there's a, a little breakdown on your spread on your sheet in front of you for reimbursement for municipalities. So typically, Chapter 115 benefits at a minimum are reimbursed uh, back to the town from the state at 75 percent. So those uh, are the financial assistance or medical assistance portions of the Chapter 115 benefits. And then there are a few things. Um, that are reimbursed at 100%, uh, the cost of flags for graves for Memorial Day, uh, emergency housing and assistance uh, to prevent homelessness, uh, burial assistance, and then obviously our training and certification from the state is at 100%. So you can see down below that there's a, a little breakdown and a trend of historical data that relates to uh, the veteran <coughs> service budget from the town and reimbursement from the state. Um, if you go back to FY12, uh, they were reimbursed, uh, the town was reimbursed 78% uh, for a net cost out of the total budget uh, of 59173 As we trend forward <coughs> through the years, FY14, uh, you can see that it's 64%. That's because the reimbursements from the state are offset by a year. So we'll, we'll continue to see those funds be reimbursed. Um, down one more block, veterans served. So you can see in, in 2012, we had a total of 49 clients enrolled. And now uh, currently, I have 69. And then we're projecting next year and increase in clients up to 75. So we provide additional resources. We have a new resource center that was dedicated uh, July 3rd last year. Um, so that's in my office. Another resource for veterans to seek benefits, services uh, right in the town. Um, provide mandated job counseling for veterans receiving Chapter 115 for our unemployed vets. We assist with all the federal, state, and local benefits and resources that would be available to them. Um, and I just want to touch on an additional point that out of the uh, 155,000 that we're looking to have reimbursed, of that, 116,250 would be reimbursed by the state at a minimum. So leaving a, a net cost to the town of approximately $38,750. Um, for those of you who are kind of unaware of the type of programs that we, that we offer and services, I just want to give you a brief summary of a few instances uh, since I've come on board. Um, dealing with providing benefits, I had a 91-year-old veteran uh, living at home. Her brother-in-law had called inquiring about benefits. Um, so she was low income, therefore she uh, qualified for Chapter 115. We were able to provide monetary support, fuel assistance, health care support, 
and then uh, additional resources <coughs> since she was qualified for Chapter 115 uh, for additional utility discounts and uh, looking for tax deferrals. So what was the net benefit for this person? Lifelong resident of Arlington, and she was able to remain at home. So that was a success. Um, another one, a veteran had called inquiring about funeral services. Uh, the call was for funeral services for that veteran who is currently receiving hospice care at home. So both the husband and wife, low income, they qualified for Chapter 115 benefits. So kind of a sad story, but, uh, but we're able to help them. So I also filed a, a federal VA service-connected disability claim for the veteran. Um, potentially, we'll get that review, get it approved. So they'll receive additional resources, which will decrease the Chapter 115 that we're providing to them. And also for the surviving spouse, we'll be able to provide um, and file for a federal uh, DIC, DIC or widow's pension uh, for the spouse. So, so that's important as well. So ongoing, help reduce costs for the Chapter 115, but be able to provide those state and federal level benefits. Um, and the last one real quick, two brothers, uh, both veterans in their mid-20s uh, came in. They are technically underemployed. Uh, part-time jobs making you know minimum wage still living at home with their parents uh, both had significant issues health issues and <coughs> health issues uh, coming back from deployments so he was able to provide immediate resources for them for their health and mental health issues through the VA um, and also for both of them filing service-connected disability claims so with that in mind, they'll receive additional finances from the federal government, again, reducing the, uh, the burden from the Chapter 115 benefits. But again, to keep them back up and running, get their needs addressed, and provide them with the benefits and resources that they need. So that's a summary. Are there any questions? So I have a question regarding a uh, veteran. Is there a highest amount? capped for like a poor veteran or how much of the maximum they can good get there is it's since it's means based uh, there's a maximum fuel allowance that they would receive which would be two hundred seventy nine dollars a month there's a maximum uh, <coughs> assistance for housing living um, and then medical assistance as well uh, but that kind of all e each case is is so individual uh, that it does it's based strictly on the numbers that they provide. Okay, Brian. Um, what are the demographics of people receiving services? Like what age? And Typically, for our 115 uh, veterans, they're the older clientele. Um, the vast majority are living in subsidized, or you know, the, uh, they're living in the housing authority apartments. So lower income. Social Security only um, for I'd say probably 75-80%. Uh, I do have about four right now unemployed veterans that we do provide some additional resources for them um, and then the others are uh, kind of in between like the 20 year olds that require a little but not, not a lot of support. Yes sir. Okay, Dean? So following up on that, when so when we've gone from 49 in 2012 under one chapter 115 to anticipate 75, is this a, we're just breaking it into demographics, is this, a, is this increase of 50% being driven by a 65 year of age group and older? I think most people yeah. would, because I would, obviously, I think most people look at that number and they'd say, oh, these are veterans who went to Iraq and Afghanistan. but. What you just said was probably these are Vietnam vets who are now retiring. Uh, the vast majority of the Chapter 115s are still in that World War II era. Uh, the older surviving uh, veterans or surviving spouses. Because that's the other thing with this program. Uh, Massachusetts is the only state that provides these type of benefits 
for dependents as well, so surviving spouses. So we're kind of peaking at World War II. We're now starting to see an increase in the Vietnam, Korea era of veterans. So that's the anticipated increase. Okay. Paul, this question <coughs> is, is more for the manager. How does this request for 155000 for the reserve fund work with other requests that might be coming down the line for reserve fund transfers? Well, I, I think at this point it's fair to say that any reserve fund transfer has an impact on how we're going to make decisions about covering the stone ice deficit. So it certainly has an impact. I don't think it uh, takes the trains off the tracks, <coughs> but it impacts our decisions in which way we go from there. If a, uh, if a veteran was burned out of his house, Red Cross usually <coughs> comes in one, two, three nights in a motel. Are there services or money or help you could provide? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, and, and we have. Um, we've had a couple of cases already this year where uh, through either a home fire or some other uh, setback at home, whether it's loss of heating, um, hot water, uh, through the state we're able to provide that emergency relief up to seven days. So we, we put them up in a local facility. Uh, we get 100% reimbursement from the state. Uh, we're able to address those immediate needs uh, because there is a uh, zero tolerance for homeless vets uh, for the state. So uh, that's our main goal, to take care of their immediate needs. And then during that week, uh, we can look at providing additional resources or relocating them to uh, an appropriate facility. Is a vet that, that qualifies, um, just curiosity, uh, have to be honorably discharged? Yes. Okay. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, uh, the request is for $155,000 uh, for veterans' benefits to be going to the Veterans Services budget. So moved. Second. Okay, moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion or questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, unanimous. Okay. Uh, thank you for coming in and thank you for your service. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thank, thank you. Time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, facilities department. <coughs> All right. So I think as most of you are aware, uh, as contained in the budget proposal, uh, is the creation of, or at least the initiation of the creation of the facilities department in the FY16 budget. Uh, so there, there's some detail contained in the budget book, but we want to be able to provide the Finance Committee with a detailed <coughs> presentation about really the multiple years worth of work that's been put into this concept by the Building Maintenance Committee. It provides you a little bit of the thought process, the background, and the reasoning behind this year's proposal. Uh, so I'm going to give a brief overview, go through a few slides. Uh, you should have a presentation that was handed out in tonight's um, materials. Uh, and then I'm going to have Andrew uh, go over a few of the slides, and then also ask Ruthie Bennett, who some of you may have met. Ruthie Bennett's the town's regional energy manager who we share uh, with the town of Bedford. Uh, and she's also going to go over several of the slides within the presentation. Uh, also, before I get into it, uh, I want to just recognize the members of the Building Maintenance Committee that are also here tonight. So Andrew and Ruthie sat on the committee. We also have Barbara Thor uh, Thornton who sat on the committee and was really the, the brainchild and the impetus behind all of this effort uh, starting on the Capital Planning Committee. Uh, and we have Vince Sabone as well. And, and Christine Deschler, the most important. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she's going to vote. Um, so, before I jump into the slides, um, you're, you're gonna, we're going to hear a lot of um, you know fact-based reasoning and best practices in this presentation tonight. But um, to start out, really from where I sit, this is something that's about trying to address a structure that currently does not align management responsibility with uh, budgetary responsibility. Uh, and, and you'll see that when we start looking through some of the organizational charts. 
Um, and I, I think this winter season and the snow removal that needed to take place in school roofs became an instant uh, anecdote and perfect example of the issue. Um, right now, the, the superintendent of facilities is a division head under the Department of Public Works director <coughs> whose budget and funding for his position is com completely contained within the school department. Uh, so when it became an imperative that we need to start removing <coughs> schools, there was no one manager who had authority over a budget to make decisions about how we were going to go up about spending and properly allocating the costs that would go along with removing the snow from the roofs. Now, we got it done, and we'll figure it out. But I think it points out right off the, right off the bat uh, that there, was, there, there is not a sufficient management structure in place to properly address really the, the 21st century or, or, or any century needs of a real complex organization and its facilities. So to start, um, the, the, the first slide after the cover slide, uh, we just have some, some highlights of what we think this proposed facilities <coughs> management department will yield or provide. Uh, first, a new department. Uh, we're talking about a department that is separate from the school department and separate from the Department of Public Works, an actually independent uh, department that will collaborate, of course, with those departments and other departments that have facilities, uh, but yet an independent department. Uh, we're talking about a new director's position, which we'll talk a little bit more about uh, later in the presentation as well. Uh, but this is a department head level position, not, not a division, uh, a department head level management uh, personnel. Uh, we also believe that this proposal on this department will produce long-term capital benefits by extending the useful life of equipment uh, through better maintenance planning and better repair scheduling and, and, and management of systems and equipment. Uh, we also think, and we'll talk more about this as well, uh, there'll be uh, short-term cost benefits uh, with enhanced management and coordination of the current personnel as well as better management and coordination of the contract and services we have for both cleaning and maintenance and repair of equipment. Uh, we feel pretty confident that we'll be able to achieve some short-term cost benefits. Uh, and then finally, uh, we also feel strongly that we'll see long and short-term <coughs> quality improvements. And what I mean by that is just simply better running, longer lasting systems, and an improved uh, experience, I think, for building occupants when you have energy systems that are being maintained properly and, and functioning properly, probably <coughs> more important than even being maintained properly in this instance. So moving on to the next slide, uh, just quick highlights uh, of our, uh, the implementation plan that we framed. Uh, so this uh, year one being FY16, uh, the upcoming fiscal year, uh, we're looking to officially create this facilities department. Uh, again, one of the big steps of that is funding the director of facilities position. Uh, the proposal that's before the finance committee this year has 50% of that position's funding in the town budget and 50% in the school's budget. Um, we mentioned here establishing an administrative function uh, at this point, that doesn't mean creating an administrative position, uh, but rather between the current positions in multiple departments that take care of the administration, bill paying, uh, and other administrative work that goes into facilities uh, management, uh, figuring out how we're going to uh, either keep staff as it is or possibly transition some folks into the facilities department. Uh, we're also talking about, and we've actually already started this a little bit, consolidating the reporting structure for all our custodial and uh, maintenance personnel. Um, we have uh, custodians <coughs> not reporting all to one uh, to one source uh, instance. Uh, and again, we'll get into more detail. Library custodian reporting to the library director and not the director of custodians or the custodial supervisor for, for the town. Uh, that's something we've already begun to address. Uh, and also, uh, contracted cleaning services not reporting directly to the custodial supervisor, but rather to individual department heads. Uh, that's something again we've already begun to address. Uh, and then also, we're going to start looking at beginning consolidating maintenance budgets under the facilities department in year one. Year two is when, uh, if we're successful in year one, we'll want to move to actually take everything that you see in town budgets and the police budget, the fire budget, uh, DPW budget, move it into facilities, and then everything you see in the school budget that's related to facilities, move it into facilities and actually create this one consolidated department. Uh, moving on to the next slide. <coughs> Uh, you see here, we have long-term facilities management, mid-term facilities management, and short-term facilities management. And we've really highlighted mid-term facilities management. The work of the committee has really shown that, uh, you know, long-term, the Capital Planning Committee has a very robust process in place in terms of scheduling and funding uh, capital asset upgrades. Uh, short-term, uh, 
it is it being performed pretty well, but there can be some improvements, as you've seen mentioned here. But one of the real big focuses that the committee has looked at, and one of the sort of the core pieces of this proposal, is improving uh, midterm facilities management. So you can see some of the uh, the benefits that have been uh, put forth <coughs> or projected by by the committee. Uh, doing a better job of taking a look at analyzing uh, the value of town owned assets, uh, getting better at looking at what the life cycle of certain equipment and systems should be, and making sure that we're uh, putting our repairs and maintenance schedules in line with that. Um, having standards for both contracted and in house work for maintenance uh, work, and making sure that it's kept up to schedule. Uh, and then also, related to that, making sure that we have procedures in place for that all staff and contracting work are keeping on that scheduled work so that we can meet the goals that we put in, put in place. So moving forward from that slide, uh, those uh, benefits that I just outlined, uh, what do we get out of that? And you can see outlined on the slide, uh, as mentioned earlier, talking about having longer uh, useful life of assets, thereby controlling capital costs, uh, through better collaboration or coordination, excuse me, reducing manpower costs, reducing errors and efficiencies, and that's really through that better consolidation of the management of both personnel and contracted services. Uh, specifically in regards to contracted services, being able to make sure that we're not uh, being overcharged for work that's being done on our system by a contractor, uh, improving the quality of the work that's performed, uh, and also <coughs> overall improving and maintaining the condition of the facility. So with that, I'm gonna pass over to Andrew to talk a little bit about the status quo of facilities in the um, thank you, Adam. Uh, one thing I'd like to do is uh, really provide you with a quick overview of the current uh, organizational uh, structure, if you will, of the current, uh, not facilities department, but staff responsible for uh, facility-related uh, issues, uh, some of the issues with that, and then um, what we're recommending in terms of uh, our structure moving forward. Um, so I apologize that you have a black and white uh, copy of what was provided in color, I believe, through your email this afternoon. Um, but if you did see it in color, it would be broken up by yellow and blue uh, <coughs> positions in yellow funded by the town, uh, those in blue by the school. Um, so currently there are five individuals directly uh, reporting to the town manager that uh, have responsibility for uh, both uh, custodial and maintenance uh, related responsibilities with buildings uh, across the town. Uh, quickly moving through them, uh, begins with the recreation director uh, who has responsibility for um, the, the Ed Burns Arena, um, the custodian uh, in that, or the custodial support services in that building, including a cleaning contractor. Uh, then there's the public works director who uh, assumes by, by far uh, the greatest uh, uh, portion of the burden. Uh, he oversees uh, the energy manager and the town hall custodian uh, and the superintendent of buildings, which is a, a school funded position, um, and all the staff that is uh, responsible to that position. So that includes the two uh, primary divisions within uh, the school department, uh, the custodial division and the maintenance division, and that consists of custodians, uh, both day and night, uh, and uh, more maintenance uh, type personnel, including a plumber, a plumber of electricians, uh, um, and carpenters. Uh, one thing Adam had alluded to uh, early on uh, was that while the public works director assumes uh, all responsibility associated with uh, the maintenance of uh, town and school buildings, he doesn't have direct uh, responsibility for the budget. Uh, a big portion of that, uh, the lion's share of it, is actually funded through the school department. Um, but just to talk about a little bit of the decentralization uh, and the fragmentation, if you will, uh, the town assumes all responsibilities with regard to HR and benefit management for these employees that are funded in the school department, all hiring, recruitment, um, and then uh, the management of uh, all, the, all the employee benefit plans. So I'm going to keep going right across the org chart. Uh, we have the police chief who uh, has responsibility for this building and the custodian that staffs this building. Uh, then you have uh, myself as the deputy town manager who along with the director of planning um, oversees the maintenance um, of the uh, nine, uh, nine buildings that are under one cleaning contract, uh, separate from the cleaning contract uh, that I referred to in the rink, and the building manager uh, in your budget book. He's called the building craftsman and he's really uh, the primary frontline staff support. Uh, coordinating maintenance uh, and custodial services in our rental properties. Uh, and then lastly, um, the library director uh, who oversees um, the maintenance functions uh, associated with both the Fox and um, the Robins. So there's five people that report to the manager, but when we actually peeled it back a level further, 
There are 11, uh, 11 either department heads or administrative, administrative staff, excuse me, that uh, have a certain level of oversight of uh, more than 40 buildings. Um, and in the next slide, uh, this, this will be broken down. Uh, like I mentioned, there are currently three separate cleaning contracts supervised and procured by three uh, separate individuals. Um, there's a, a lack of a formal oversight uh, of both staff and cleaning contracts, and uh, the large part of that is supervising staff may often work a different schedule uh, than a custodian in a building uh, or the hours of uh, the cleaning contracts. Perfect example is Town Hall. Uh, we close at 4 o'clock and uh, the cleaning contractor comes in at some point after that. <coughs> um, one other uh, major component is uh, facility capital planning uh, and budgeting is decentralized. <coughs> uh, I sit on the capital planning committee uh, along with Robert Thornton and our chairman, Charlie Foskett. Uh, and one thing uh, that's always asked is how department heads go uh, about identifying capital projects within their facilities, uh, how do they prioritize them, and then how do they come up with the budget for them. Um, I, I think our department has uh, do, do a good job, but uh, one of the questions always asked is, was there input for the facilities? Uh, and because of the uh, decentralized nature of uh, our approach, uh, the answer is often no. Um, and then uh, lastly, uh, a huge gray billing burden. Um, I don't expect uh, too many of you, uh, aside from your meetings with department heads, uh, to have a full understanding of what the gray billing process is. It's kind of unique to Arlington. Um, and that is often, there's, let's, let's you know, take an example. Uh, midday, there's a uh, pipe break in town hall. Uh, the uh, building superintendent, uh, again, funded through the school department, will uh, dispatch a plumber uh, and any other necessary staff, whether it be custodial or not. Uh, then the, the, the manager of that division will cost out what that, that associated expense was. That gets billed to the individual department. That gets sent to the controller. Um, and then the funds are <coughs> um, transferred based um, on uh, the work and the expenses that were incurred. So it really is involving not only the school department, but a specific division within the custodial uh, or maintenance uh, division, uh, the department that needs the work done, and then the controller's department. Um, I think if you uh, talk to our department heads and our administrative and clerical staff, I think they'd all agree that it's uh, one of uh, the greatest areas for alleviation uh, as a result of uh, moving forward. Uh, then um, if you turn to the next slide, um, what we're proposing, um, under the direction uh, of the town manager with uh, uh, input from the superintendent of schools, uh, there'd be a director of facilities uh, reporting to the town manager. Uh, below that would be the deputy director. Um, that's a new title, it's not a new position. I think it's important to note. Um, that position would essentially be what is today uh, the superintendent of buildings. We just, for the sake of uh, simplicity, didn't want a director of facilities and a superintendent of buildings. So uh, we thought it was a bit cleaner uh, to call it a deputy director. Um, then we have uh, the energy manager, um, the regional energy manager, and then uh, an administrative support function, which uh, as the manager said, would come from um, a reconfiguration of uh, current resources. We have a clear uh, um, two divisions, maintenance and custodial services, uh, both managed by a supervisor. Uh, some of the changes you'll see uh, under the, the supervisor of maintenance, we'll put um, the, the individual who's currently responsible for uh, the coordination uh, of maintenance and custodial uh, related activities in the rental properties. Um, and then what we'll do under the supervision of custodian, uh, not only take uh, the school custodians uh, that are currently there, uh, but move over um, town custodians, uh, library, town hall, um, community safety the building we're in today. Um, so that's, uh, that's what we're uh, proposing. Um, again, I apologize that it's not color. color uh, <laughs> In color format, but there's a new color in this one, and it's green, and that's what would be jointly funded. Um, and those positions would be the director of facilities, uh, the energy manager, which is uh, currently jointly funded, um, and the administrative uh, support function. Um, with that, I'll hand it over to uh, Ruthie. Thank you. Um, so, as the town manager noted, currently we are not functioning very well when it comes to maintaining our assets, and so the facilities department is. Uh, one of the methods we're going to use to actually maintain our assets better than we're doing now. And you'll see there's a few questions here that we thought you might have. Will the department save money? Will it save time? Will it improve quality? Um, and I want to go through a few slides with you of examples of how the facilities department will function differently than we're functioning now. 
and why this consolidated department will actually help us save money, save time, and improve the quality of our assets. Um, so for example, the capital cost of major repairs. Um, some of these costs for major repairs come upon us when we were not expecting them. We don't have a 10 to 15 year plan of mid, uh, mid-term repairs and maintenance. And that can often cost us more by not knowing a big expense ahead of time. One of the examples is this past summer, we bought a chiller for the Pierce School. All of the summer school programs were moved to that one building. We bought a chiller big enough to air condition the entire building. Um, the good thing was that nobody complained about the temperature in the Pierce. Everybody was happy. It was cool all the time. The, the bad news was that the chiller was cycling constantly. Between three and five minutes, it was on and off, on and off, on and off. Um, and we didn't know this because from a thermal comfort point of view, it was fine. But from a new software we had implemented, and we were watching this chiller because it was very expensive, it was new, we hadn't had this before, uh, we noticed from this new software that the chiller was cycling constantly. And the reason was when it was installed, it was installed to um, cool within a half a degree bandwidth, meaning if the temperature slid a half a degree up or down, the chiller kicked on. So of course nobody was unhappy from a thermal comfort point of view, but not only were we wasting energy, we were wasting a lot of money, and we were shortening a lifespan of this new chiller. And if we hadn't sort of understood that we have a new piece of equipment, we need to focus on monitoring it on a consistent basis, on communicating with the staff at the school and with those of us who are looking at it, we would not have figured this out. And so I'd say we probably would have lost, you know, a quarter of the lifespan of this new and very expensive piece of equipment. Um, and so within two months of installation, we, we saw the problem, we recognized it, we worked on it, we fixed it, but we also memorialized in notes from those two months <coughs> what happened. So the goal is that next time we buy another very expensive piece of equipment, we will from the beginning know the specifications of what this piece of machinery should be set to. And it isn't just that one person knows it, but it's been memorialized, so we know what happened and we know what we want to do next time. That's a big sort of component of a new department is all the information will be institutionalized. It won't be one or two people were there, they knew what happened, they forgot or they moved on and we don't have that information with us anymore. Um, the next value will be reducing the manpower cost. So as the deputy town manager said, there's a lot of people managing a lot of other people and those department heads, those department heads often that's not their expertise to manage a custodian uh, or a maintenance person. Um, so in the new department, the goal would be that there's one person who has oversight, but also has expertise in maintenance, in facilities. They understand what the problems are, what the fixes could be. They'll have suggestions. They'll know what work should be going on. Um, we'll be consolidating three separate cleaning contracts, which are now supervised by three separate individuals. So there'll be one person to say, these are the standards for cleaning in Arlington. So all the buildings, or the buildings that are similar, will have similar standards. And there'll be one person understanding if it's being done, if, we, if we're hitting our, our new standards. As opposed to three different contracts, three different people, who, who knows if we're really cleaning to the level that we want to clean. Um, this will certainly alleviate burden on uh, departmental administrative staff. And as the deputy town manager said, many department heads will be happy not to have gray billing going back and forth between the school and the town. Um, and there will also be this opportunity for consistent performance evaluation. So every custodian, every maintenance person will know what their performance is going to be based <coughs> on. There will be one department where everybody is in a similar boat. It isn't that you work for the town over here, you work for the library over there. There will be a more um, uniform understanding of how you are evaluated in this department. Uh, another value is going to be reducing missteps and inefficiencies. And unfortunately we have quite a few of these because there aren't in place policies and procedures for how to initiate and implement a project. There's a lot of, please fix this, this isn't working, there's a leak, it's cold, it's hot, but there isn't, we need to fix this on a longer term basis. This is a project. Who's going to do it? When are they going to do it? What's an emergency that would take that person off of that project to go do something else? That kind of calling someone off and on happens multiple times in a day. And not only do the projects not get done, but the staff who's doing the project feels sort of torn in different directions. And they're not, you know, this is my editorial, they're not as motivated and as excited because they know they get here, they set up, they're working on it, they get a call, they have to go somewhere else. So 
there's a lack of uniform policy and procedures for doing the work we need to do and knowing when someone needs to be pulled off to do something that really is an emergency. And sometimes we do incur extra costs for people coming, doing a project, they have to stay late because they didn't finish the first project. Um, so we're trying to lower the number of missteps and the inefficiencies within our own staff. Uh, one of the big goals is going to be to reduce costs for emergency repairs. Um, I'll give you an example. We had a thermal comfort issue at the middle school. And there was, um, I think it was a basketball game that evening. So parents and students were going to be there, and we had to fix the heater. Basically, the rooftop unit in the gym was not working. We did call our third party to come in and fix it. They came and they sent somebody. You know, we sort of all relaxed. It was going to be fine by 7 o'clock. Unbeknownst to us, in the middle of the day, there was an emergency at the library. They also called the third party contractor who told his person from the middle school to go to the library. There was no one to blame. It was just that that's not probably what we would have chosen, right? The library could have waited, but the middle school could not wait. So there wasn't um, a, a clear path. And in the end, we were fine. We got the person back, and you know, everybody worked with everybody. But there was a lot of juggling and moving back and forth, and no one to be the person who sets the priorities for that day or even those next four hours. There was no one to say to the third-party contractor, when you get a call from this one person, that's where you go. When everybody else who has your phone number calls you, you need to talk to one person or, or one or two people. But there's a familiarity with our staff and with our third-party contractor, so everybody feels able to call them but they need to be managed by us. I mean, we're going to pay them, so we want to manage where they're going to go. Um, improving the quality of the maintenance work. Definitely right now, certainly for some of the custodians, they don't really see the person they're working for because they're working after five and the person has left at four. Um, so they're not sure exactly what to do. Someone leaves a note, tells you they didn't like what happened. It's not a great way of communicating. Um, there's also, like I said, project oversight. We'll set up a project that'll take four days, and we want to have a policy and a procedure about how to do the project, who to tell if you have a problem, what to write down at the end of that project. Can we memorialize what was done on this piece of equipment? So that the next time someone calls and says, it's too cold in this one room at the Pierce, we could say, well, we already looked at that unit ventilator. And remember the last time the problem was X and we did Y. Right now, if the person who fixed it isn't in the building that day, nobody knows what happened. So we haven't institutionalized and memorialized our own work for us to go back and say, we fixed that unit ventilator one time already. Why, is this the same problem? Is it a different <coughs> problem? So we're losing our own value of, of knowledge by not having one department where things are recorded. Um, and one of the biggest goals and value for, the, for our town is gonna be improving the condition of the facilities. So we have a long to-do list in many of our buildings of what we'd like to do. Painting, flooring, appliances that should be upgraded, the building systems. Some of them get done when they come up in the capital process. Some of them get done when there's an emergency and that thing broke. But if you're not big and you're in the capital planning process and you're not an emergency, you kind of get lost. So the painting doesn't happen. The carpeting in the classroom gets worn out and doesn't get replaced when it should. So the goal is to have a 10-year schedule for all of our buildings of, of mid-term maintenance, not a huge purchase like a chiller, but flooring and painting and mid-size appliances, when those things should be turned over and, and redone or, or purchased new. Not to say that if there is an emergency, that project might not get pushed, but at least it's in the queue. Right? And if someone says, I really want this classroom painted, we say, you know what, you're in year three. It's coming up. So we have a schedule. It gives people a peace of mind that we're looking at their building and their classroom. But there isn't sort of jumping ahead and everybody kind of angling at that moment to get what they need. There's a system, you know, and we will discuss the system with all the department heads to say, this is where we think your midterm repair and maintenance has to happen. And, you know, it won't be just the facilities department. It will be in concert with all the department heads at clearly the school, you know, uh, committee but it'll be known and understood. So if you want something painted or you need a new carpet, it'll be in the queue. It won't be, if you can squeak the loudest, you need, you'll, you'll get in front of the queue. So, thank you, Ruthie. Um, one thing I'd like to add is uh, the recommendations before you tonight, uh, the committee spent a considerable amount of time um, thinking about and uh, by no means made uh, the decision to include any of them uh, in a vacuum, but rather uh, we looked at what Arlington considers uh, as some of our comparable communities 
um, and uh, whether or not they had a facilities department and uh, specifically how they deployed their resources as it relates to um, facility uh, maintenance and management. Uh, so what I did is I've uh, provided a list of um, those communities. It's by no means exhaustive, uh, but what I've done is list the community and uh, the square, the total square footage uh, of their buildings. They're all currently, um, they all currently have uh, a facilities department. Um, as you can see, the average of those communities is uh, just about 1.3 uh, million square feet. Uh, we're slightly above that at uh, 1, uh, 1,322,000. Um, so this is just to give you an idea of uh, what other communities are doing, uh, and in each instance it's working, it's working well, um, and when we talk to uh, both members of the facility staff <coughs> and uh, the management of those communities, uh, they all would to what a benefit it has been for them uh, since they've implemented it. So, thank you. All right, so the, the final slide, um, I'm sure one of the major questions would be, how, how will we know if we're successful and how are we going to measure our effectiveness? Uh, so really what you see here is, is a reiteration of a lot of the concepts that uh, we just spoke about uh, and these are the things that we're going to be looking at uh, if this facilities department is implemented uh, as our, our, our benchmarks and our tests for whether or not we are. <coughs> uh, we're going to look very closely at our third party personnel costs. Uh, those will be easy costs to look at year over year and we, we do expect to see reductions in those costs. Uh, you can see uh, you know, early detection of issues, uh, and then later down you see uh, memorialized details of work completed and new software uh, that will allow for more detailed uh, data to be provided. <coughs> Those all go kind of hand in hand in that uh, we're going to be able to collect all of this data more regularly and then do some trend analysis of whether or not we're seeing less emergency work uh, and more implementations of uh, successful uh, scheduled work. Um, we'll be able to see, uh, not necessarily immediately, but over time, uh, how asset life is lasting and whether or not we're seeing any improvements uh, and how long uh, high price uh, you know, capital assets are lasting. Um, we'll also be able to see uh, uh, or benefit at least from and make a, a management determination whether or not we're getting a better coordinated response uh, to, to issues that come up like taking snow off roofs or chiller issues or other problems uh, that we face. Um, <coughs> and then the, the final uh, part we hear is overall the manpower reorganization is going to have a departmental budget that leaves a fiscal trail that we can monitor from year over year. Uh, so with that, uh, that closes the presentation. And I'm happy to answer any questions at the committee. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Tom? With this new position, Director of Facilities, hold a seat in the Permanent Town Building Committee? No, that's a good question. So the, the enabling uh, bylaw? for the PTBC would have to be uh, changed, but I would absolutely think they would have to, yeah. Because the example of the children of the school, if we had somebody like that and they saw <coughs> that community, they would have known that children was only designed to do a certain classrooms and to operate certain hours. So if you did hold the seat and this came up, he would have recognized it right off. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. Yeah. And I would think he'd want to be involved in the creative building so that we do it. The current superintendent of buildings sits on yes. the PTBC. So wh whether we you know, have a loose translation of the current language or we change the language to represent the director, one way or the other, I think it's appropriate. Thank you. Okay. Are you? <coughs> question, sir, because I think there should be a lot of equipment uh, in the different buildings, right? Do you have any inventory system of uh, like when the equipment were bought? For example, this A equipment was bought in like five years ago, B was like bought in 10 years. Do you have some kind of like a lock state or street state? Yeah, so we actually do have a spreadsheet of all the major pieces of equipment that we own um, when they were bought, uh, sort of specifications about them. But that literally is in a spreadsheet in one person's computer, so it's it's not utilized yeah. very well. But it does exist on like a simple level, yes. I mean, that might be the easiest way to go and log in, right? <coughs> if somebody goes and repair that, then you can pr probably log in when it was a repair and Right, so they're actually, the, the school um, bought something called School Dude, which is a software program that does work orders, and one of the values that it has is a way to have a spreadsheet that you can do, it's set up for that kind of thing. <coughs> this is when, what the repair was, who did the repair, what they did, exactly. So we trying to sort of grow into a more sophisticated spreadsheet that can handle that exact situation. Okay, Ken? Uh, what would be the number of personnel in this department? 
Yeah, we can. Um, <coughs> so, in terms of net new positions, it would be one position. Um, uh, total would be <coughs> one, two, three, Just about 50, 55? Personnel? Right, and, and again, that's one more than what the existing structure is. Yeah, and this would come from other personnel in the town. Right. Correct. Well, we're not so talking any new, except for the uh, director, not to, uh, talking any new hires right now. <coughs> we're talking transfer people, people who are in existing jobs, they transfer to the, to the uh, facilities. So cost-wise, it's the cost of a, of a uh, new director. That's accurate. Is that a fair statement? That is a fair statement. Thank you. Okay, Andrew, I'm sorry, you said 50-50? 50-55. Okay. Uh, moving along, okay, Jonathan? Yeah, um, Andrew, under the current org, org chart, uh, there's a building manager that reports to you, it looks like. Um, <coughs> and then in the, in the proposed org chart, there's a rental building manager under the supervisor of maintenance. Is, is that the same position? It is. It's and, and what, what does the rental building manager do? So um, he serves his official title uh, with regard to the uh, wage classification plan is building craftsman. Uh, so he's responsible for any small repairs associated with um, any of the uh, rental facilities. So those include buildings that are currently under the authority or jurisdiction of the town manager, uh, one under the board of selectmen or the ARB. Um, so it's to just go through them very quickly. It's Central School, 23 Maple Street, Jefferson Cutter House, uh, Gibbs School, Parmenter School, and uh, former Dallin Library. Uh, he also coordinates um, most of uh, the custodial type work that happens there. They're all under one contractor uh, that up to now I've supervised. <coughs> um, and he uh, manages any private contractors uh, that do work in those facilities. And so your feeling is that with the consolidated department, you're still going to want somebody who's just focused on the rental buildings? Yeah, I think uh, cer certainly uh, in the interim, it's absolutely necessary. Uh, there's a lot of work associated with them. Um, there's over 10, 12 tenants uh, between all the buildings, so they have uh, competing needs, and he really does a good job in uh, providing them, and then uh, we work uh, on how we fund them. And, and, and under the current uh, structure, often we wind up uh, working with facility staff uh, that again is under the school department um, to get some of that stuff done. Okay, Thank Alan, you. Can I uh, catch up in just a little bit? I, I would say, you know, we have, we have the benefit of a longtime employee who has in depth familiarity with the buildings that Andrew listed. So, should there be physician changeover? I, I think I can see where you're going with that question. You know, a new person doesn't have that benefit of a long tenure with those buildings. There might be some benefit to them taking a second look at how we maybe use personnel across the department more. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you want to eliminate a position. I'm just wondering whether in this new structure, the distinction between owned and rental buildings need, doesn't really, you don't really need that, and you don't need a person that's just for the rental building. Okay, Alan? I think it's an excellent idea, and I appreciate all the work that's gone into it. In 2020 hindsight, you wonder why it wasn't done a long time ago. But I have two questions about scope. I think you've already answered one. This does include the redevelopment board properties, the right. schools, and it covers that. And the second one is where does the facilities end? Does it include the front steps, the landscaping, the sidewalks? Um, I'm going to say uh, all, all the way, all the way out the land, the landscaping to the street. Yeah, sort of. Yeah. Okay, John. Uh, a good deal of what's proposed here involves transfers of personnel and money, if you like, from the schools into this new department. And uh, when you described how this was developed, I, I maybe I missed it, but I didn't know that, didn't realize that there was anybody involved uh, with the schools or a representative from the schools. Mm -hmm. Has this all been cleared with the superintendent, et cetera? Yeah, so Diane Johnson <coughs> sat on the building maintenance oh, committee. Okay. Uh, so she, she was okay. highly involved. Uh, it, it has been agreed to by the superintendent. They've included funding for half of the position in their proposed FY16 budget. Uh, and then if we were successful in creating the position, creating the position uh, what I would do is sit down with the superintendent, uh, hammer out an MOU between the two of us in regards to how the new uh, framework would work, and that would set the stage for FY17 and actually moving the budgets out where they are now and building the budget. 
Okay, Mary Margaret. So for example, with the library, you'll, you'll take that um, custodian and the, con the cleaning contract out of there, but then will you save money because you maybe have to pay a differential for to work nights or, and weekends, but wouldn't be overtime like there is now? But you like that? So the, the, the current individual who staffs the library would remain in the library working his normal schedule. Um, we're not proposing moving him out or... Right, but would it save any money though with the new way of managing the time? And in terms of backfilling his position or after hour events? Or, yeah, or not having overtime because his hours are this now, but he gets a differential for working weekends instead of having to work overtime, for example. That, that level of uh, budget impact, we, we haven't really looked at yet. Uh, all the um, library maintenance money, has, as you uh, know, remains in the library budget this year. Mm -hmm. uh, waiting to see the outcome of that, but that will certainly be a consideration. But so then, but the goal then is to take all that money out of the library budget, though. So all the that that that's part of the whole implementation plan, correct? Okay, Charlie. So first thing I'd like to say is that the presentation was really great. It's very very well done, and uh, I think this is a fantastic idea. And I'm glad that the town is going through with it. Um, I have a question on slide 11. And um, you say that we're going to reduce manpower costs. How are we going to measure? Um, you know, one of the problems that we have traditionally had in the capital planning community is that we spend uh, hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of dollars on things that are going to save labor costs. And we go ahead and spend the money and get the equipment. Uh, I'm thinking, for example, um, we had a big project for automatic reading of water meters, you know, that was going to save a tremendous amount of labor. But the labor never gets saved. It just gets into this vast pool of expense. And <coughs> you've identified uh, management people that are managing things they're not supposed to be managing and other du duplicate efforts throughout this, which I think is great. But how are you going to actually measure that you save money for the town? And, and what are you going to do with that money? Are you going to reduce the taxpayers' taxes? What, what is what's the end game here? So I would I would say year over year we're going to have to look at both FTEs, contract and cleaner, and determine whether or not you know balancing for inflation uh, of whatever the contracts for for either would be, uh, of whether or not we are seeing that curve go down. And in terms of manpower for internal, you know, overtime would be part of that. Well, can can, can I ask that that you? make it a major objective to track that. All of these costs that you've identified now, track how they get changed, and actually report to the Finance Committee how much you're saving and what you're doing with it. One thing I'd like to add is one of the goals is that um, the third party con HVAC contractor is called quite quickly. And there have been a number of times where we could have handled it either with our own staff or we could have done a lot of the legwork first before we call them. So one of the things I'm going to look for is reducing the cost of unnecessary third-party contractors. So that's sort of external to our own staff, but we're not using our staff as wisely as we could before we pick up the phone and have to pay someone just to drive here. So, But have we, for example, looked at the cost for the last two years for all of these activities, put them together in one place and said, you know, this is our, our current cost and this is where we would be two years from now? We have looked at snapshots of that, and then when we do create the consolidated department, absolutely that will be in one line. Um, I, I wouldn't say that today we've set goals of where we're going to be, but I think once we have a department structure in place, we'll absolutely have to set those goals of where we think we should be. Thank you. Okay, when, um, okay, so the school department is on board. Obviously, that's the, the biggest part of this entire thing. Um, town meeting would be on board when they approve the facilities department in the budget process and the and the departmental head? Is that what you're looking for? Or mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be really, it would be approval for the funding of the facilities director. Okay. Um, so once you, uh, that goes, you go back to the schools and set up the structure and, the, you know, if money is shifted out of the school department into the uh, this budget, obviously you've got to sort yeah, of yeah, revamp it. Yes how the whole five-year plan divides up their money and such. Okay. Um, you're memorializing all this knowledge. Um, 
from my vast experience as being the facilities manager of my church, <laughs> which I, I happen to get when I missed that meeting. <laughs> we created, we just, you're probably doing the same thing, but we created a website that's just for property. And everybody has, everybody who's supposed to has access to it. And all the contracts go up there, and, and I'm, you know, this is probably what you're gonna do, but uh, it has worked, you know, amazingly well, because before this, all of the stuff was in dusty boxes. Yeah. <laughs> all over the town, all over the church. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, a separate website really is sort of cool way to yeah. consolidate everything and put it together, so just a thought. Um, Dick? <coughs> Does this mean all your craftsmen and uh, custodians come out of the <coughs> school budget and go into here? <coughs> Okay, David. I, I just um, I want to thank you for your presentation. And just going back to, to Charlie's point, um, I've, I've been I'm an old time. I've been around a long time. We had a position in the town of Allington called Director of Properties and Natural Resources, yeah. <coughs> and that position was cut uh, um, for two reasons: one for monetary, and it was a reorganization. In a sense, that position is coming back. In a sense, with this, am I correct? I think without the natural resources, uh, then right. correct. Yeah, the properties. Right. Yeah. Okay, uh, Stephen. Yeah. Um, just a question on the expenses other than than labor. Um, so for your third-party contractors or, or for materials related to maintenance, does the expense go to the department where the building is? So if, for example, if there's the work that needs to be done at the Audison, that's an Audison expense. Right. Okay. So. What if there's, and, and this has been a recurring issue just that I've been involved in through the recreation department and the youth basketball program. And so every year we have an issue, you know, when's the floor going to be redone or, or resealed at the audits and, and at the high school? And, and I'm making a pitch before I make the question that once the department is created, it should be done every year because those both those buildings are used seven days a week. But what if there's a dispute between the facilities? department and the schools as, as far as whether that should be done every year. Who, who, who decides? Because it is a maintenance issue because the, the life of the floor really depends on how well you maintain it. But if the expense is going to be in the schools and the CFO says, no, we don't really have that, who wins and, and how, how does that get worked out? I, I would think in the proposed arrangement, the facilities director would be the first line of defense. And then me working with the superintendent, if they, if it got risen or you know if it rose to that level, would make the final decision. Because I, I see that even, and I think this is a great idea. But after years of between talking to Joe Connolly, who recognizes how many programs are in the building, yeah. talking to Mark Miano, who understands that there, there's yeah. an issue, and then being told no, there's not money in the budget. It, it's not something you know. We don't need a new structure to know that that should be yeah. done every year. But we do need to right. prioritize how that works. So I, I hope going forward that if more money is needed for maintenance as a result of this department, it gets put in there because there's no sense in creating the department if you're not going to maintain the buildings. Okay. You, you know, you see, you raise an interesting point with all this. With the facilities director, you have a department head level position whose priority is going to be the facilities. So when making capital budget requests and then operating budget requests, we'll have facilities first. The truth is, you know, when a police chief or a school CFO or a deputy town manager is making a request, the priority might not always be the facility. There's myriad priorities. Right. But a facilities director's priority will be the facilities. So it doesn't mean it's going to get funded, but I think you have a better chance of having a person that will be more focused on the facilities and not have as many other balls in the air at the same time when trying to make a request or a decision. Which is good. Just one follow-up. And, and I think I hope there's better coordination because the schools may not realize how much the recreation department mm -hmm. is using the facilities on weekends or at nights and um, through the growth of different programs. And while it's, it's a good thing for the town because there's more revenue through these outside rentals, it's not good if you know a group uses the facility and says it's no good, we're not coming back, or, or there are a number of complaints. Okay, Paul, I'm uh, sorry, Dean and then Paul. Well, I, I handful of questions, I'll try them real quickly. Um, director, of, you have a new position, director of facilities, you're converting the superintendent of buildings 
and to the deputy director, you're adding a bunch of positions under them, so they would probably have a position reclassification next year. So Carolyn would be in that request because you're adding a whole bunch of stuff in, under their purview. Is that a fair assessment? So I can here chart the org chart on page six to the org chart on page eight. There's a series of responsibilities above right now, the superintendent of building. You're now putting them under. So we're going to have a new position, and then we're going to have a reclass at some point. It's an incremental cost, but I just want to make sure we're on the same page. It just, just speaking to superintendent of buildings, the deputy director? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, then, then yes. You're going to reclass the position. Whether it be through, you know, yes. The answer is yes. Okay. Um, ring cleaning, same chart. When I look from six to eight, ring cleaning dropped off the org chart. Is that because rent cleaning is going to be outside of this? <laughs> you think it was just an oversight? So yeah, no, it's, um, so we have three uh, cleaning contractors currently, um, <coughs> and I broke, they've been broken out in the current org chart, um, and they've all been uh, put together into all third-party cleaning contractors, school and town, considering the rink uh, cleaning contractor, I'm town sorry, contractor. Right. Right. All right. All right. right. the right to the bottom, the long, the long one. Uh, no, no need to manage energy. Or well, I just I'm curious why you wouldn't have taken that position and put it up under you, so it could have responsibility for both public works and facilities. Or do you feel like the bigger challenge with facilities? Well, I would say, and, and Ruthie could probably speak to it better. Ninety-seven percent of her efforts are facilities focused, with some smaller okay. focus on vehicles, uh, you know, whether it be HVAC boilers, uh, every, everything that we do in terms of green upgrades is, uh, is facilities focused. So, again, 97, 98 percent. Right. There's there some vehicles, but it's okay. we're looking for a green lawnmower, but mostly I'm doing uh, boilers yeah. and chillers. And All right, and then so the last question I have is you're creating two separate, um, creating sort of a, the, the structure is created outside of public works. It is, that is correct. Right now, and so now you sort of get worried about the unintended consequences of having, we talked about, we, so we just talked about a whole bunch of facilities departments that aren't unified and coordinated and inefficiencies and stuff like that, and now we're gonna have a facilities department that's separate from a public works department. So do we, do we have any concern that we're gonna create a whole new set of non-unified, not coordinated problems? I, I, I actually think it's more appropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's much more uncommon to have a public works department that's responsible for facilities than it is to have public works that are responsible responsible for public works and a facilities function responsible for facilities. I mean, there'll be a learning curve based on the history and the culture that currently exists, but I, I think we'll be avoiding more problems than we, than we would have for unexpected problems. Okay. Okay, Paul. Um, just a few quick questions, I think. Um, the, there was a talk in here about software needed to manage this thing. Is that part of the uh, IT strategic plan at this point? So I believe the schools yes. have already purchased yes. the software. Okay. Um, the, the building maintenance committee, is it going to stick around as kind of an uh, oversight or a, um, a resource for the um, building the facilities? I want them to. Yes, uh, I, would, I would imagine they would. Um, on the, going back to the library thing, right now what happens when the library custodian goes on vacation? Is there someone, they bring yeah. in a third party to do it or is it someone from some yes, other building? It, it, it's, a, it's a great, um, great question and it illustrates part of the uh, problem. Often we get a call or when I say we, the town manager's office gets a call from the library director, uh, who then calls the facilities when the day, the first day, scheduled day, the library custodian's not there because they're on vacation. That's when the library director got around to letting us know. And then they scramble and have to make a uh, quick decision on who they can get over there. Um, so our whole goal is that having all the custodians report to the um, custodial supervisor, uh, he can know who's on vacation and the employees resources accordingly. Yeah, that, that sounds like cool. yeah one of the things that this gains from the, this organization. Um, and the last thing I have is um, on maintenance and the how it improves the quality. I, I hope that um, we have a history before they did the renovation of this building of um, this room being very cold for our meetings, and I, I hope that <laughs> for our <laughs> audience, given to the building Thank you. Hey, Alan. I have another comment and support. I think another benefit 
that isn't really stated here, particularly related to the rental properties, is better cost accounting. Remember, years ago, a few years ago, we were debating um, about disposition of certain rental properties, and I remember a famous moment of a former town manager and a former director of planning where the town manager insisted that we were losing money on some properties, and the director of planning insisted we were making money on some properties. Now, the revenue side of it's pretty easy, but the cost of the facility is pretty difficult. So I think unifying this um, will, will certainly make the cost accounting better, including depreciation and other things like that. So I would, I would call that a benefit of this. Okay. Uh, Carolyn? So on your fourth chart, it has the energy manager listed as 0.6. But yeah. I thought you were 0.88 now or 0.86. So I work um, basically one day in Bedford and three days in Arlington. Not every week it's like that, but general it's 0. 0.6 <coughs> here. 0. 0.6 yeah. here, and then I'm point basically one day over there. Okay. So then why why does the reclass have you as an FTE of 0.88? Oh, it's an FTE of 0.88, which is the same as 0. 0.6. No, no, no. So, so no. This is her. This is this would be the energy manager's Arlington mm -hmm. representation is 0. 0.6, right. and the remainder is their Bedford representation. The way it works, we budget them at that, and then Bedford gives us. Oh, the office. Office. So they, they really okay. show the, the time the energy manager has in Arlington at the point six. Okay. So we're, they're, they're paying us. Right. Okay. Okay, Dick, is this going <coughs> to stop all gray billing between the departments? Thing? Is my asking, the school department has a revolving fund for buildings. They get money from all their rentals. And they can't spend it only on maintenance of buildings. You know that one? Okay. How are you gonna are you gonna be able to take and, and build back maintenance out of this new department to that on that? So when we when we sit down for FY seventeen to take the money out of the school department yeah. and from the town, I, I was actually thinking about that part you mentioned today. We're, we're going to have to figure out exactly what they're spending total, you know, yeah. out of this general fund and out of that revolving fund to figure out what the appropriate portion is. Yeah, a lot of money there. Okay, what? Yeah, I was going to ask about the revolving fund. But um, also, <coughs> as far as, as the cost accounting, I mean, the school has to report to the state what they're spending in total. So there has to be some estimation of how much of this facilities department is going towards the school. I think also for the other departments, it's still useful information to have. We already have hidden costs with insurance and health benefits. We don't really know what our library costs as a result because those costs are hidden. So if we hide more costs, I, that, that gets us even further away from the goal of finding the true costs of our library and our schools. So if you're, if you're de developing a mechanism to track the costs for the, library, for the schools, it might be useful to continue to you know, unofficially bill back to the library and the other departments so we know what the cost of those operations are. So this software program that the school has invested in does that. Every time a work order happens, it's how much time was spent, who did it, what they, you know, all of that happens. It's just mm -hmm. we don't have that deployed everywhere, but yeah. there is that software that ha answers that exact question. So you can then go back and just query by library time, you know. We just have to expand right. to that. Be interested and see how the age of the building relates to the yeah. amount of maintenance, just to or the use, right? I mean, some right. the, um, yeah. middle schools use way more than maybe the elementary schools. It'd be interesting over time to take a look back and see. Yeah, I can ask questions of the software or what's being done. Okay, other other questions. Okay, well, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm hoping that this will be as wildly successful as the development of the capital plan back in the 1980s. Wow, that's a high catch yeah, <laughs> And you're involved with both, Barbara. Thank you. Okay, thank you for coming. Appreciate your time. Okay, um, Dick, I'm glad you mentioned that fund. Keep in mind all these little pots of money around. Big pot. <laughs> Okay, just briefly, could everybody take a look at the uh, handout uh, dealing with MBTA assessment? Okay, go to the, uh, the first page, which has Arlington up top. Now, uh, this just 
came about. Um, Adam and I are both members of the Fiscal Policy Committee of the Mass Municipal Association. And at the last meeting, they had the uh, MBTA Advisory Board, which is not the MBTA, but the Advisory Board and a person from that office talking about MBTA, because that seems to be a topic of discussion these days. And he handed out this sheet. Actually, there's a couple more sheets with it, but I handed it just this one about the MBTA and their assessments. You know, we pay two and a half million dollars in assessments every year. And so there you take a look at it up top. So our assessment is about 2.596 and a little extra, but we're paying a lot of money for this. And then I started going down the sheets, you know, Belmont, well, it, the population is easy, but the weights, how the heck did they come up with these weights? Well, Belmont, you know, we don't have a subway line in Arlington. We've got one on our border, but we don't have one in Arlington. Belmont doesn't either. Well, they, they got a train service. Boston, of course, has everything. Uh, Brookline Green, you sort of go down through it, and they, then you get down to Bedford. Okay, well, you know, Bedford should be a lot less because they just have bus service. And then you get down to Beverly, and then you get to Braintree. Wait a minute. <laughs> Braintree's got a major terminal right. inside of Braintree, in addition to all the bus service, and they pay one third of what we pay. Okay, now my, my blood pressure starts to rise about this. Wait a minute. And you sort of look at that, and that said, that makes absolutely no sense. And then you go onto the next page. Okay, I didn't put an next page on mine. I'm not sure why. <laughs> and you get down to Quincy. Okay. Now you get down to yeah, Quincy. Quincy. They're also a three, and they pay a million eight versus our two and a half. And Quincy's got three MBTA stations, sub red lines, subway stations, right through the middle of, of Quincy, plus all the bus service. So I went to the gentleman afterwards, and I said, I was focusing on Braintree at the time, and I said, how are all these weights determined? Well, they were in the, le they were in the legislation. And he just happened to note, mention that at the time, the chairman of the Transportation Committee in the House of Representatives came from Braintree. <laughs> I mean, this is, uh, you know, uh, so anyway, then my blood, blood pressure was this high. Mm -hmm. And, and, and Braintree is bad enough. Quincy is even worse. Uh, so we're paying three times the amount that these places are paying with no subway service. Granted, we've got a lot of bus service, but still. Um, so Adam and I, are, or actually Adam, because he gets paid more than I do, uh, is writing a letter, and we're going to try to get our legislators uh, and senators on board, because this makes no sense at all uh, that you know, the money we pay, that's a lot of money. And, uh, you know, I suppose just comparing it to Braintree, uh, you know, they're, it's almost two million dollars, million eight. We're paying more than they are. And it makes no sense. So, um, mm -hmm. as I ask you, you know, with the local aid, if you happen to bump into your state rape or state senator, you might want to mention this. Uh, there's a breakfast meeting in Lexington um, that we're going to, and we're, we're going to mention this. It's, it's, it's a lot of money. So, uh, sure. You know, and so if any of you are thinking, you know, well, good luck with that, getting them to change that funding formula right now. I, I think the reason that it may be an opportune time is that as part of the MBTA's more prominent fiscal woes right now, uh, it is rumored that the Secretary of Transportation is in favor of increasing these community assessments. So if there is a look at the community assessments, I think that's the time to strike and say, okay, if you're looking at more money, why don't you take a second look at how, uh, how it's allocated out. So I think that there might be an opportunity yep. uh, for that door to open up and have us have uh, time for it. Yeah, and we really need to, uh, you know, make this, a, make this an issue. Uh, um, I, I, not, not to bring up another issue, but uh, for example, for, for years, um, Medco reimbursements that we got back, uh, our reimbursement was less than Braintree's, picking on Braintree today, was less than Braintree's, even though we had twice the students that they did. 
And that's because obviously they set the assessment at one level and never changed it. So even though our population was going up and theirs was going down, it was still the same assessment. So, you know, sometimes we've got to look at these things and uh, um, this is the time to do it. So if you happen to bump in, might mention it. Maybe there's some secret reason why we're a nine. I, I'm not sure what it would be. We have good bus service, but so do a lot of other places have good bus service. Well, some people would dispute that we have good bus service. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm one of them. I'm trying to be nice uh, on that. Multiple bus yeah. lines. Multiple yeah. bus lines. I, Put it that way, John. i just like to point out strategically in terms of what you plan to try to do here, that that whole collection of communities with nines represent allies because they're all much, much smaller in terms of almost virtually all of them are much, much smaller in terms of the service that they get than uh, Boston. So we're not the <coughs> only ones in this situation. There's a whole host of reps and whatnot who are in this situation. I, I think that's fair. And, it, and I don't necessarily think the approach ultimately is Arlington shouldn't be a nine and move other people up. But certainly, give us some rationale for why Quincy's not a nine. Yeah, but, but we're, we're not alone. There are a whole host of, you know, maybe tw 12 or so uh, communities in this situation. So this is the time to get some, that's all we're looking for, is sort of a, a level playing field or some, some basic fairness in how these assessments are going um, on that. So, okay. Um, so much for my rant. Uh, snow and ice options, uh, that was asked um, how we're looking at that. And uh, the manager has given a, uh, uh, a piece. I, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Obviously, um, if we take a look at the reserve fund, um, we've we voted about after the 155. We're down to 715,000 in the reserve fund. Um, the fire um, budget has has been mentioned. I took a worst case and took 80,000 out for that. So that's 635. Um, so let's say the finance committee threw in 500,000 into the snow and ice. Um, that would bring it uh, down to about 135, which gives us some backup going into May and June, uh, in case something else comes up that we really are not familiar with. And uh, I think the April 13th meeting that I mentioned to you, that last meeting, uh, when we try to pull everything together, might be hopefully a good time we can make some decisions uh, on that. But that's, uh, even if we throw in 500, uh, you know, that's still another 300,000, according to this, 313,000 uh, that we have to come up with from other sources. Um, do you want to add anything to So one thing I do want to mention that we, we are also asking for one, hopefully one further author, uh, authorization for deficit spending on the last sheet. Um, there are about, uh, Mike Rodemacher lays out, and I know Andrew, uh, uh, we, we mentioned in the, uh, the memo before you, an expectation of about another eighty thousand dollars in costs, and then uh, you know, should it snow again or uh, you know a few times, there could be further costs. So we're asking for one more vote this committee uh, to push the limit up to two hundred thousand, or an additional two hundred. Yes. So it goes up to one million four fifty for total for total debt to authorization. Correct. Uh, Adam, well, push my head. I think it was part of the last meeting. What inroads have been made? Um, Getting aid from federal or state authorities, I think Dean was mentioned, and I just heard kind of tangentially on, on the news that uh, there may be some uh, pockets of funds available based on uh, the need of the town uh, in this situation. So the, the second page of the Snow and X memo uh, has a, a breakdown of what uh, current efforts we've made in Lima. Uh, so you can see that we've submitted costs for what they've outlined as four separate storms uh, with the date range of each of those storms. The only storm that's been designated as of yet as reimbursable is the first storm, the, the, the official blizzard. Uh, so if we get 75% back, which is the normal reimbursement rate for a new Mexico claim uh, from that storm, uh, we could get up to 274,000 in change back from that storm. 
Uh, if they did decide that the other storms were reimbursable, uh, if you have that breakdown, you can see by storm what we think we would get. If all of them were reimbursed, uh, we could receive over $750,000 back. I, I don't know what the prognosis is for storms two through four <coughs> to be uh, made reimbursable. Um, I know the MMA is working very hard at that. The governor is working very hard at that. Uh, I think the governor's strategy is basically make storm one through four one storm. That it was really the cumulative effect of them that created the emergency right. situation. Uh, so you know, make that entire duration reimbursable. Are there any other questions for the manager on snow and ice? <coughs> Coming on board, do you know we have the snow and ice committee? I've, I've heard of the snow and ice committee, but I don't think it's met in my, during my it time. It hasn't met in two years. Yeah, it might be longer. I think it was created by uh, town manager. Kind of meant to be meant three times a year, getting the middle and at the end. Um, yeah, I, I would hope when the smoke clears, you might want to call that to be it to hopefully help. All right. Okay. Alan? Um, I was just wondering if you could comment on the, any uh, uh, aid we received from out of town. Like, for, for example, I know there was something called the Beast, on, the Beast of the East, the East going East. down Quincy Street that really widened it, and it certainly wasn't a piece of our equipment. Uh, I mean, where, where, where does that come from and how's it paid for? Yeah, so in the immediate aftermath of the storms, uh, MEMA was in full mobilization and was getting resources both uh, in terms of private contractors and using uh, their resources to pay that as well as help from other state departments of transportation. Uh, I think as far as New Jersey, we had uh, crews coming up. So we first had a crew, uh, a private crew, uh, Newport Construction or Newport Contracting, um, came in and they did a great deal of work on Broadway, down to Bayton River, and then some work on Warren Street uh, clearing back. They didn't have very large equipment, but they came in, I think they worked a total maybe two, two and a half days and didn't cost the town anything for that clearing work that was done. And then we had put in a request for uh, a big piece, a big snow blower on a front end loader or a big piece of equipment like the Beast of Beast that you saw. The first thing we got, and I'll, I'll chuckle a bit, is we put in that request and then we got a call that said, your snowblower equipment's coming down. It's on the way. So we mobilized uh, some folks from DPW to manage it. And two bobcats with snowblowers showed up. <laughs> <laughs> and there were some, there was some uh, feelings to be dealt with in terms of uh, the expectation level. But those two pieces of equipment went down the bike path from the Lexington border. They made it almost to Brigham's uh, at some point during this aftermath uh, to clear snow off the, uh, the bike path. And then we did finally get the call uh, from uh, Mima that the Beast of the East was coming down and we did get Quincy Street done a, lot, a little bit more work around the Otteson. I think we get some more school work done but unfortunately the equipment arrived and uh, <coughs> shortly thereafter broke down. Uh, <laughs> did some good work. Did a great job. <laughs> you know, when, when, when it was working it did a great job. Uh, worked for a little while, broke down again. Uh, and then, you know, that equipment is only as, va is a, as valuable as the dump trucks that you have to go along with it because it moves fast. It, you know, it picks up a lot of snow and gets into the dump trucks. So we, it also had seven uh, dump trucks along with it from MEMA. And they, um, they were here for a while, and apparently they said, oh, we're called off, but we've got some replacements coming. Uh, they got called off and the replacements never came. So we got some benefits out of it, not as much as I think we... We're hoping to get, but it was very nice that it was there. Now, in terms of the total cost of the storm, is there any way of estimating what the sort of donated efforts would have cost? Or, or Yeah, you know, I could probably ask Mike to estimate. Uh, you know, I would guess, though, somewhere between forty and $70,000 worth mm -hmm. of work. That would be my guess. I, I, okay. Not, not huge. Not millions. Not, not huge. Thanks. Dean? I'm sorry, Alan, are you finished? Yeah. Okay, Dean? So, we Heard, we heard conversations with that year um, of the people under your authority went over to the school department to help them shovel off the roofs and things like that. And that Andrew brought up the fascinating concept of gray billing. Um, so what's going on there? Are you guys thinking about billing them? Are you talking to them? Are we going to hopefully absorb it into the other stuff? What's going on? So my, I am talking to them, and you know, my thoughts on it are, as we look at this, we're going to be looking at town operating budgets. We're going to be looking at every budget to see where we can piece some things together to cover it. So my expectation is I will ask them, can you cover some portion of this? 
but I don't see it as a full court for us to say this is your responsibility. Uh, if out of that facilities revolving fund, perhaps, you know, there's some uh, leeway or flexibility, I would appreciate that contributing, but again, I, I don't, I am not of the position that it is their responsibility to come up with that money. Okay. Well, I appreciate you saying that, obviously, because I think we, and we've talked about it before, I, <coughs> I, I do, I will always say appreciate the degree to which you work with the superintendent of schools versus being adversarial. And, you know, we've also talked about, you know, the reserve fund is, well, it's actually not yours, it's ours, right? It's supposed to be used for all appointing authorities and things like that, so I do, <coughs> I do appreciate your diplomatic way that you, you appear to be handling that. I love it. Charlie? Uh, yes. Uh, Tom uh, Kagawara last week, I can't remember what they would raise the the question of using the Ryder Street property as a snow farm or whatever you call it. All, all year. All, trees, all year round. Leaves, yeah. snow, yeah. You, you know, <coughs> taking it back. To help reduce the cost of trucking snow and other stuff out of town. Have you, is this, have you heard of that before? Or? Yeah, I have. And, and I, I, I think there's, there's some pros to that and, and, and some cons to that. I think uh, the pros is it's, it's a currently town owned, town controlled asset. Uh, it's in, already sort of industrial. It's industrial use. It's kind of in a neighborhood near the path, but it, you know, it, it's somewhat well situated. Um, cons, it's a contaminated site, and I'm not exactly sure what impacts that would have. Uh, and then may maybe also on situ where it's situated, that could be a con as well, right next to the rink, the bike path. Uh, snow wouldn't be such an issue, but maybe other debris could be become an issue for folks using, <coughs> using that path. My preferred approach, um, this is probably going to be the first time I, I talk about this in a public meeting, but I, I, I think um, the space that we used two or three years ago, um, the field behind Stop and Shop adjacent to DPW, um, I think that's the spot we really need to focus on. And I immediately, folks involved with athletics would say, nope, you know, we, we're practicing there, you know, we need that for the sports field. So I think, and this is actually Mike Rademacher's brainchild, the finding way. <coughs> to acquire the land at Poets Corner that we're currently using for snow that's owned by St. Camillus. Uh, <coughs> acquiring that, making it into a sports field, um, thereby replacing the sports use, and using that lot or that field behind Stop and Shop, cutting it in half, having half be for DPW as a lay down facility for snow and debris and other uses, and then half be parking for the high school to alleviate the current parking problem, and then also provide modular classroom space for an eventual project. That, that would be my preferred sort of more master plan for addressing that need. Okay, Tom? Two things I see wrong with going to Bowles Corner. One, it's not zoned, and you'll have every neighbor there at you. And I don't, just don't feel it's an ideal. I wouldn't want beep, 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 bang, and then whatever, and debris. Oh, no. see from my I'm window. saying I think Bowles Corner should be a sports field. Right. So, oh, okay, I'm sorry. So that we can oh, take okay, the sorry. sports field that's behind the Correct, I'm sorry. Second of all, if you maybe take a walk down by this property, there's more debris there than what you'd put there as a town. <laughs> I don't know about snow, yeah, but. <laughs> well, I'm just saying that that's, you know, and that comment um, makes more sense to me in Ryder. It's already zoned. It's, um, yes, it could have any, any potential land is going to have a problem. Um, it, it's right there. We own it, even though we make gross income of $95,000 a year. I don't know what that comes out to. But the figures the last three years in snow are definitely going up. I mean, this year is crazy. We know that. The trend seems like snow is global warming came and left. And it seems like we're going, and we just have nowhere to put it. And it, you know, we're moving snow from the res, and then from the res, we're paying to get rid of it. We're moving snow to here. I just really think that that's one area we need to invest in, and at least we have an area. Yeah. Right now, we don't have an area. <coughs> you, you, you are correct. And one, I don't, one way or the other, we have to identify an area. How long is the lease on that property? Uh, I believe we have another five years after this job. Okay, so any other questions? Okay. I mean, the real good idea that was suggested at this finance committee uh, at the last thing was to put it all on Robin's farm and create a ski resort. <laughs> but my, my idea actually was to catapult it all to the great heavens. <laughs> 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 
Okay. Uh, well, uh, just one other idea. I don't know if you heard about what they did at, at Fenway Park, but they brought in uh, 20 tons of black sand, and that actually brought the level of snow down from, I think, 12 feet down to about a foot. Now all we have to do is figure out what to do with the black sand. <laughs> 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 you put it on top? Is that you? Yeah. 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 Okay, Charlie? Yeah, I moved the, uh, um, the motion on uh, additional funding for the snow and ice. Second. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Okay, any further discussion? Okay, so we're adding another 200000 to the deficit spending, bringing it to a total of one million four fifty, and then we'll figure out how to pay for it, you know, probably on our April 13th meeting, when hopefully this is all set. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, okay, department heads step increases. Uh, the committee, uh, several, well, a couple of people on the committee had uh, asked about how that was determined. Uh, there's a, a short memo here. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to follow up on it, but uh, Paul? Um, just one question. Of, um, when the union contracts are all settled and practice has been to give the managers the same percentage increase, is that correct? Uh, in terms of uh, cost of living as we call it, yes. Right. Yeah. Um, so the plan would be to still do that in addition to these um, increases? Yes, so that would right. be my intention. Um, and is the same true for the um, police chief salary, which just got a big bump? Uh, so with the police chief signed for would be what his compensation would be, not anything additional. Well, are you talking about a step or the cost of living? Uh, the cost of living. No, the, his contract actually states that he'll receive cost of living adjustment in accordance with other uh, employees that he would receive. Thank Sorry. you. Okay, is there anybody other questions? Charlie? Yes, I have a question about the statement. I do not plan to offer step increases beyond midpoint in different amounts of merit, but rather I plan to offer step increases for positive is, is that not uh, what I mean is I, I don't mean to put, uh, I have no intention of putting in place a system where someone gets X and another gets Y based on the outcome, but rather, you know, the positive performance, you, you get a merit increase if you don't, you don't get Okay, thank you. Okay, are there any other questions on this issue? Okay. Um, solar. Uh, okay, here's the status of uh, status of energy and fuel contracts. Uh, we uh, we're interested in how this works and when are these up. And uh, do you want to add anything to this, Adam? Uh, no, I, I think it's it's somewhat self-explanatory, but happy to answer any questions. Okay, Jonathan. Adam, um, is that the the electric supply rate? Is that off by a factor of ten there? I don't think you're paying 88 cents a kilowatt hour. It is. That you can catch yeah. So that's 8.8 0, 0. 8. 8. cents. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, what was the correction there? Uh, it should be either 8.80 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. uh, cents or 0. 0.8805. Okay. Any other questions, uh, John? Uh, did you evaluate the possibility of the, the town simply installing the solar panels themselves and keeping the, the are there equivalent of these things that, that for private individuals, like SREX and all that stuff? Is that all? <coughs> is that all a part of this? Do you want to jump the solar? Did? Okay, what well, he's going to take care of that next. Oh, I'm sorry. This is just on the back of this. This is not just on the long term uh, energy supply contracts. Okay. Sure. Do you have any hedging built in here? Uh, what's it? These, are, these are just sort of long term fixed contracts. So um, They are hedged. 
I, I guess they, they they're are hedging. So no matter what happens, yeah. if it goes down or up, this is what whatever the market does, we're paying for the duration of the contract. Okay, anybody else have any questions? Okay. Uh, uh, when does the new rates get to uh, <coughs> these end this year? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, some, some of these are ending this year, like the, the global uh, gasoline contract? Yeah, so what I, what I did for gasoline, those are just, an, we do that annually. So you see the one that's ending this fiscal year and then the one that begins uh, next fiscal year. Okay. okay. Anybody else? Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Kelly, you had a question? The electric supply contract, um, do you um, buy for street lighting separately? Uh, no, 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 we do not. So that, that pricing is inclusive of street lighting? That pricing would be inclusive of street lighting, yeah. Okay, John? Uh, do we still have a maintenance contract uh, ready on the street? Uh, it's with, uh, now the company's called Siemens. It was with Public ITS, but I think it was ready with it before. Siemens bought with Public ITS and then that was. Oh, okay, so it's, a, it's an outside contract. Thanks, Anybody else? One thing to mention, uh, in case you're thinking we're getting really great deals on our gas and electric, this is just supply. It's not transmission and distribution. But the utilities, we, we pay a separate bill to NSTAR and National Grid, and then we pay supply for these groups. Uh, these uh, solar power purchase agreement. So, uh, I'll very quickly say, so I, I tried to lay out um, some of the key points in this memo I provided. Uh, this is really a project that uh, Ruthie Bennett, who was here earlier tonight, has done a great deal of work on. Uh, I think it's something that John Dice asked about at town meeting a couple of years ago about uh, you know, what the town was going to pursue. Uh, solar energy and school buildings. Uh, the, the long and short of it is putting uh, solar panels on six school roofs, uh, producing <coughs> just about um, 800,000, a little more than 800,000 kilowatt hours a year, uh, and then uh, projecting based on uh, the energy produced by those panels, uh, saving um, around $100,000 a year. And you can see the table that was provided in the memo, uh, providing uh, just about $2 million in savings over a 20-year period. Um, somewhat of a, a complex financial scheme that you achieve that savings by, we would still be buying all of our energy from uh, the grid, from NSTAR or Eversource <coughs> and, uh, and our supplier. Uh, we would then also be buying the energy that is produced on those panels for 12.8 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, but then we'd be getting a net metering credit from the utility at the market rate, which is currently, the B3 market rate, which is currently 25.49 cents, uh, which is what creates the savings of, of this scenario. Uh, so to the point John is getting at, if I may, um, the, the real key of why entering into a power purchase agreement is more advantageous for the municipality uh, are the tax, uh, tax benefits that a private company can realize by making this investment versus a municipality. Uh, so that's why uh, we, we've seen uh, a large number of municipalities in the state go through a power purchase agreement with a private developer. So you don't have the upfront capital costs, and the overall economics are better based on the tax incentives that are available to a private. Well, the reason I asked the question, not thinking about the municipalities, it, I sort of went through it for putting them on our roof, and I decided it was a far better deal for me to own them than to have you know, one of these contractors essentially rent my roof. So have you gone through that other possibility? Has anybody well, so tried the economics of that other possibility? So we, we, yeah, we, when you look at the economics, we would get the SREX, the Solar Renewable Energy Credits, mm -hmm. but we wouldn't qualify for the tax incentives oh, that okay. Amoresco would qualify for, or a private homeowner would qualify I see, for. okay. Uh, so because of that, economics are better for uh, them. Uh, now I understand, so, okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay, Jonathan. Yeah, um, it says here uh, that um, there's a provision that um, if there's if a facility has to go offline for major repairs within the first ten years, the town will reimburse Amoresco for the lost revenue. And is that by lost revenue? Is that just 
the lost sales of the power to the town, or does that include their loss of S Rex? It's uh, a good question. I, be I believe it would be loss of revenue from the town. Uh, and I, I think you, you might be thinking about the high school. Uh, and uh, that was going to be my follow-up question. Yeah. In terms of the high school, and, and I don't know if, if Stratton would also be in, you know, an so, issue uh, there. What, what's the risk associated with putting the facilities, so putting the panels on those two buildings? So for the Stratton, they're going on the portion of the building that's already been renovated, uh, okay. so there's a uh, lower <coughs> risk. Uh, for the high school, <coughs> the, purchase, the power purchase agreement has <coughs> built into the flexibility for us to be able to move the panels during the duration of construction, find alternative locations, generate power, and then put them back on at the conclusion. Okay, other question? Oh, yes. For the John Dice comment, um, they get the tax benefit because no. we're paying their profit. You know, we're, we're, we're paying their margin. Right? Yeah, I think that's fair. So why does that, <coughs> if, if we were to be, if we were to be installing it themselves, wouldn't we not be paying that margin? Well, that's a, that's a fair question. Whether or not the margin we pay exceeds what <coughs> cost is if we just put it on ourselves without the tax incentive. Right. Yeah, let me um, let me ask Cadmus so on that question. That's a fair question. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, well, go ahead. Okay, what? <laughs> Uh, just a process question. Was there a competitive RFQ or RFP process for this? Or, or? There, there, there was. Good question. I, I should have put that in here. Uh, so we were, by uh, association, part of two competitive uh, processes for uh, so One, we were part of an ESCO solicitation at the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. And under an ESCO is an energy serving, uh, uh, energy uh, service contract. Um, uh, we were on a, a multi-community MAPC uh, Solicitation that included solar panels. Also, uh, the town has a membership in Power Options, which is a, a power purchasing consortium. Um, we fit into that through Ruthie Bennett's uh, work in Bedford, and they were a member of Power Options. They also did a competitive solicitation that resulted in Sun Edison as a developer. Uh, and after comparing their proposed draft PPAs and terms, uh, Cadmus, the consultant that we got a grant to work with from DOER, uh, suggested that Amoresco was providing a better deal for them. Okay, Dick. Who maintains these? They do. And we don't pay any for the maintenance? No. Okay. Be because it's in their financial best interest yeah. to generate electricity. They're, okay. they're renting the roof. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it comes yeah. down to. Alan and then Charlie. I see uh, a lot of new um, covered parking lots with panels, airports and things like that. Was, is that is that, was that discussed as part of this whole thing? Seems like we have a lot of parking lots that could be covered. It's sort of a win-win because it keeps the snow and rain off the cars, though. So we looked, um, <coughs> we had I had asked them to look um, at the DPW parking lot, and it wasn't big enough to provide the necessary scale. Uh, their initial proposal did actually include a complete and total canopy over the Russell Common lot. Uh, mm. and, and at this point, I felt like a much larger public discussion would be necessary <laughs> based on the aesthetics uh, of putting something like that in early yeah, sector. Sure. Um, so it's not <coughs> off the table, but right. to be able to move this project forward, uh, we're looking at the schools and not moving forward. Okay. So I see some fairly, I see some stores with, you know, just, you know, 10 or 20 spaces that have them, and I'm not sure what they can all so don't bother me at all. Everybody can plug their hybrids in. Go ahead, Charles. Yeah. Uh, just a, a sort of a general question, I think I've already mentioned this to you. You know, I'm, I'm sort of concerned that this is a 20-year contract, and, um, we haven't had a lot of success with 20 year contracts, you know, contracts that have duration here. Um, you know, what, what's our ability to exit this contract if we, we don't like the way it's going? So, one minute, and I, again, we, we haven't spoken about this uh, to some degree, but uh, if, if something dramatic in terms of a change of law, so that metering credits went away or SREX went away, uh, and the economics went wacky in terms of this. Uh, the contract would allow for both sides to enter into renegotiation to try to get the economics back into balance. Uh, also, there is the option within the TPA to be able to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, buy out the system uh, if we chose to from from Amoresco. So we'd have to 
take a look at where we where we thought we were economically if things went bad and decide whether or not it would be better to buy the system. What, what is the value of the system? Uh, there's a statement of values in the PPA. I, was, I, I didn't bring the PPA in, I should have done that. Uh, but there, there's a statement of values in terms of uh, what it would cost to buy, remove, uh, for the system. So we, we do have that statement of value. How many panels were involved? Oh, jeez. Hundreds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, hundreds of dollars. Uh, Wait, is, it, is it worth more than $2 million? This program is okay, are there any other questions? Gene and then Grant. So I think I already know the answer because it's not in here. Um, so they're gonna get they're gonna build these solar panels on our buildings, our roofs, the stuff, they're gonna I guess sell it back to us. Um, so in a hypothetical situation, um, someone were to do this on one of the buildings along Mass Ave, or let's say a row of buildings on Mass Ave, um, that <coughs> building, I get to forget if you contemplate this contract, that building, can they attach it to a building on Mass Ave, <coughs> I think default into being real property at that point, be subject to property tax, because um, it's physically stuck on the building, it's not something you can move and all that. Um, what goes on here? Are they just sort of getting a little bit of a de facto property tax windfall because it's on a governmental building? So, uh, not necessarily. Uh, there's been some recent case law, uh, not in uh, an exact scenario, uh, but in a similar scenario where <coughs> solar panels have been exempted from property tax. Uh, but with that said, um, from what we've seen in other communities, some boards of assessors <coughs> choose to assess it, uh, and, and some do not. I've had some preliminary conversations with the director of assessing and the board of assessors. Should they choose to assess it, it will impact in, that, in, the, in a direct proportion what our price is. If they do not choose to assess it, we're paying what's being proposed right now. So that there's no, there is no handshake that you won't be from. What do they do if you put it on your own residence? They assess it? Um, I believe the tax value is the property, yeah. Okay. But not aesthetically. Okay. Uh, Grant? Um, I concur with uh, some of the comments about the uh, length of the relationship and uh, the acquisition. <coughs> so I appreciate you looking into the uh, acquiring rather than um, uh, renting the roof to somebody to a 20 year tenant. Um, I do have a question, so uh, one, two questions. One is about the um, Amoresco. Um, can you tell us who they are or about them or something? Um? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're a very large firm that uh, primarily does uh, ESCO work, and that's energy service work, where they'll, they'll come in in a comprehensive manner to a community or organization, uh, not necessarily a, a city or town, uh, and do uh, energy efficiency measures throughout uh, the building stock. Oh, and they're uh, nation, nationwide. They, yeah, and they're nationwide. And, and, what, and usually those contracts are structured on, they, they'll, they'll do all the work. Uh, the organization will bar, borrow the money, they'll do the work. And then the work is paid for by the energy savings that are promised. And then if the right. energy savings don't pan out, the company like Amores goes on the hook. Right. So basically they say, we're going to do $10 million worth of work. It's going to save you a million dollars a year. And then you pay it down over 10 years. And they take the risk of putting and it they all take on. Right. If it we'll doesn't save a million bucks a year, they cover the difference. Right. <coughs> as right. part of that work, they also do uh, so much work as well. So, and you, what you're talking about is they're, they're basically their <coughs> they're capitalistic profit on doing They're taking the risk and they're making a lot of. Um, and so they're a for profit, and are they public or is this a pri they're private? Um, I don't, you mean by the trade? It? Yeah, I, yeah. Uh, you know, I guess. Uh, no, exactly. I I would invest if I could. If, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and the other one was um, on the rates. Um, this is fascinating stuff. It is just like the you know the the, home, the decision the home homeowner would have to do. Um, the net metering credit. This is on the financial terms and considerations. Which you know all of this right off the top of your head. It's amazing, but. Um, the net metering credit from the utility uh, based on the market price of electricity and then they say about the current calculations. So 
So is that based on it? Um, is it directly and exactly related to it, or is it like a proportion of it, and that proportion changes uh, depending on the rate increases? Is that a question? So, so the interconnection agreement, it's called, that we would sign with the utilities or with every source, would state what rate classes to be used. Um, I don't claim to be expert on what this means, but what we would be signing is something that commits it to the P3 rate class, which today is P3 market rate class, which today is at 25 cents right. amount. And how often would that get adjusted or something? Does it say? Uh, um, it would fluctuate. It would fluctuate with the market. You know, so when uh, you understand the direction here, is there's a disparity, and does that disparity grow over time so that they're um, uh, more profit for the company because of the difference in the rates and what they pay us and what they charge? Normally, but okay. Well, so no, the company Amoresco is charging us 12.8 cents for 20 years. Right, but no, what I no mean they're charging the market, what they would charge the market. So, uh, but they, don't, they, they won't charge the market anything. They'll just charge us 12.8 cents. And then we get credit from Eversource, not from Amoresco, from the actual utility. Because we're, we're still buying the energy from the grid, as we always have. Mm -hmm. And then this energy is getting produced on the panels, and it's going back out into the grid. Right. And the grid's using it. Right. So we still buy ours. We then pay 12.8 cents for what's getting generated. But then we get that market rate credit, which is today more and projected to always be more than that 12.8 cents, so that we make money off what's being generated. I, I understand the difference between what the town pays and what the market rate that we would be getting. Yeah, yeah. But the market rate, uh, so I'm saying, so Eversource is the one that's getting the benefit of the discrepancy in the mar of an increase uh, in the market rate. If, you know, we, uh, we I, I, I think Eversource would tell you get get rid of net metering credits. We hate it. Please don't make us pay people for this money, okay. uh, for this energy. All right, fair enough. Okay, Stephen. Yeah. Adam, is there an estimate of what what percent um, of each building's uh, power needs would be generated by the solar? Uh, we do have that estimate. I, uh, my recollection is that it's roughly about thirty percent of the cumulative power use. Of the as soon as he said that, it's uh, it's you know it's less in the high school and the Odyssey than it is in the elementary schools. Uh, but cumulatively, it's about thirty percent. Okay, so so, <coughs> it's so in terms of what we're so there's not more being generated. Just just have a question. I guess that gets into the to the owner ownership. Um, it, as well, so we would be everything that's generated by the panels would be utilized on site. There, there's, there's not more capacity that that's going out to the going so out to the grid. I might not be wording that. No, right. everything that's generated actually goes out to the grid. No, I know, but but what's being generated is less than what the needs of the buildings are. Yes, yes. Okay. In total. Correct. Okay. Uh, okay, we've uh, always, I'm forced to have the manager come back another night. So we've certainly got to go through all the Warner articles with them. So if we could just keep the number of questions on this down a little bit. Um, right, can, can I just ask another follow up, Al? Okay. Uh, sorry, I have a second question. Uh, um, just a question at the end of the term, um, was there, I've seen other arrangements. The 20 years is what's important to the company in terms of investment and, and, and use. Is the useful life of this? 30 years, or, or is 20 years considered the useful life of the panels? I think the expectation is somewhere between 25 and 30 years. Okay. And at the end, we could either renegotiate a continued arrangement with them, or we could purchase the panels and then begin receiving the electricity ourselves. Okay, thank you. Okay. One, one last thing on that. So, um, Amoresco makes money, right? How, back to the rate thing. How does Amoresco make money? They make their money through the combination of solar renewable energy credits, tax incentives, and then what we pay, the, uh, pay for the electricity. And they make most, in this arrangement, they make the lion's share of their money in the first 10 years. Okay. Charlie? So uh, I'm still concerned about the 20, 20 year aspect of this. And um, over 20 years, if you look at, you know, just take our current budget and grow it at 2.5% a year. <coughs> The present value of our budget over 20 years is something like $2.1 billion. In, we're going to save, uh, two, the present value, according to this report here, is $1.9, just about $2, $2 million is the present value of the saved money. 
if any time during this, if you said that the equipment value is, is higher than the two million dollars, so at any time in the in the course of this project <coughs> that something goes wrong, we're going to have a liability that's greater than that's substantially greater than two million dollars, all for the potential of the of a savings value of two million dollars today, which is that's less than. Uh, tenth of a percent of our budget, you know, of the present value of the total budget. I mean, strategically, is this the right thing to do? I, I, I'm a, I'm, I struggle to understand what could go wrong so dramatically that would completely wipe out. I don't know, but I, I can tell you, in 1973, when we voted for the for the Neswick, uh, the garbage, you know, burn trash and, and get energy. Uh, everybody said nothing could go wrong. The price of oil is going to go up. You know, now we're paying that price of oil is lower than it was in 1973. What? So I, I'm just, you know, we're, we're getting involved in another 20 year contract, and and the problem is, you you're right. You can you can't see what's going what could go wrong because you can't see you can't see 20 years into the future and know what's going to happen one way or the other. So we're, we're, but one thing we know is we're going to have a risk for, for a liability for this equipment, which is going to be somewhere in excess of $2 million, probably 4 or $5 million. And the present value of all the savings is $2 million. That, to me, doesn't seem right. Wait, what, why? They were on the server. Project. If we, if we get out of the contract, if we want to get out of the contract just for 10 years, we have, we, we have a liability of the unamortized value of this equipment. Yes. And, you know, somewhere in excess of $2 million, probably $4 or $5 million. So, and it, yeah, maybe the contract says it will be negotiated, et cetera, but, you know, that liability is out there. <coughs> and what I'm saying is we're signing up for 20 years' worth of something. We don't. We, we don't know all of the parameters and variables that are going to happen over those 20 years. The present value of our savings is $2 million. It's less than a tenth of a percent of our budget. If something goes wrong in a given year, we're going to have a, a big liability, a big impact, just the way we did with Nesworth. And that's, that's I, I, I'm just really troubled by that. I suppose the argument I hear there is that the, the town manager should not be pursuing even small efficiencies based on their insignificant impact on the long-term budget of the town. If, if, if that means that the town's exposed to a liability that it can't get out of that exceeds the savings, if those conditions are there, then, then I'd make that argument. And I, I'm not, I'm not criticizing, I mean, it, what you're trying to do, save money, it's good. I'm just, I'm looking at this as a, a 20 year commitment and the experience we've had with these 20, I mean, how much time are we spending on the Minuteman contract that we'd like to get out of that we can't get out? You know, and it's been 40 years. So I'm, I'm you know, trying to learn something from those experiences yeah, so and see how it applies. Okay. Okay. Now they were all the panels. Yeah. Okay. Not, uh, we're renting the rooms for 20 years, is what it comes down to. That's correct. And so, yeah, if I may suggest, I agree with Charlie in the sense that we're delighted that you're doing the kinds of things you're doing. You know, I, personally, I'm very pleased that you are looking at these kinds of things. But it is a 20 year commitment that's, you know, the two that Charlie cited have bedeviled me as well for all these years. You know, the Man and uh, Neswick were awful things for us. So anyway, that, that's, the, that's the worry, you know, the, the huge uncertainty represented by 20 years. Well, yeah, I, uh, we're renting, a, like you said, we're renting a roof for 20 years. Right. What do you um, want to rent? But we have a liability. And well, the liability the, is their equipment. And if we <laughs> stop renting the roof, we have to buy their equipment. You, you're not really if renting the roof, you're leasing their equipment, <laughs> is really what you're doing de facto. I mean, it's, it, it's the capital lease. The capital lease. <laughs> In which case, if you stop paying the uh, the lease, they take the equipment back. And you owe whatever the liability is. Whatever the outstanding liability is until the lease is terminated. Which okay. Is uh, Carol? Can we, get, can we get what the liability is over the course of each year? Or, <coughs> or at least over a five-year 
brackets? Well, I, mean, I, I, know, I know you want to wrap this up, uh, Mr. Chairman, but you, you know, I, I think that therein lies the question. What's, what's the risk? What's the liability? Yeah. And I, I think the, the big risk is that this cost calculation assumes a price today for market rate inflated at 2% uh, two over the course of this 20 year contract. So the, the risk would be that financially um, that energy price comes way down. So today, transmission and distribution of electricity is about eight cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, and based on that 25.4 uh, cent rate, uh, that balance of what's that about, 17 cents uh, is commodity cost. So uh, I don't think there's much of a good argument to, to say that transmission and distribution is going to come down over the long term. That's the built infrastructure, the wires, and then transformers and everything else and poles that energy is delivered over. So it's, it's all about the commodity. So electricity as a commodity would have to come down to 4.8 cents per kilowatt hour for some long extended period of time for this to even become a break even project. Uh, so even, even at 5 cents, we're not making nearly as much, but we're still in, in a savings mode or, 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 or spending less or, or earning more uh, mode. So uh, outside of that financial risk, uh, um, what, what other risk do, do, do you see? Well, suppose, the, suppose the equipment doesn't work and you want to get rid of it, and there's a lawsuit. The liability is going to be there, that liability, whatever the value of that equipment is, $2 million, $5 million, somewhere, somewhere more than you just said, more than the $2 million. We, we're going to be on the hook for that equipment. Why? Why? If the equipment doesn't we work, we don't buy electric, it doesn't generate electricity, we don't buy electricity, and nothing happens. Up there. That, that's to some degree. That's that's the strength of this arrangement. It's on them to perform for 20 years to make that equipment. Then why perform. is there a buyout clause on the equipment? Why is there? Why is there? Why why do you have to pay for the equipment if you get out of the contract early? Well, because there's still value to the equipment. Why would they allow us to just say after a couple of years, oh, we don't we don't like this? We'll, we'll take all of your capital investment and we'll keep the electricity as well. I mean, because maybe you're unhappy with the service they're providing. I mean, that, I, I just think there's a big liability here, and relatively speaking, there's a small savings. And that's, and there's a long-term commitment. So, if, if, why don't, can Charlie and I continue the conversation uh, offline uh, yes. so that we can continue the agenda? Yeah, I, th I think, you know, a couple questions have been asked as far as the, the total amount if um, uh, if you could continue the discussions and then maybe get back to us with another memo on this particular issue, and if anybody wants to, you know, feels the same way, you know, please, you know, contact the manager and see if we could get our hands around the liability issue. Grant, um, would some of this? I understand the town doesn't want to necessarily. I like the way you hedge the risk on the low end side. Doesn't want to necessarily be in a power producing business and own the equipment. Uh, that may not be what the town's role is. But I think to have the number of the, the amount, to, I think that might appease what for me, I don't know if it would appease Charlie, but uh, that if we own the equipment, what would be the amount of savings versus the, and also the amount that. A much higher risk. Yes. Yeah, I mean, then we have the risk right. up front. Yeah. Yeah. One thing we're going to be sure of in five years is still going to be operations yeah. costs. Yeah. We're, we're, we're not yeah. experts yeah. in solar panels. Yeah. Yeah. I, I understand that we don't want to be in that business, but that would help. Okay, yeah. so so why don't um, you know get to the town will vote to amend the zoning bylaws to require that all applications for building permits, special permits, and you have the warrant there. Uh, um, um, so it's, it's basically asking for an additional level of information. Uh, it'll be a, uh, a redevelopment board slash selectman uh, recommendation. Do you know if the redevelopment board is making a recommendation on it? Uh, they've made it no action. They've okay. No uh, and uh, the selectman? Uh, I did, they're not going to do it. I'm sorry? They, they, uh, they're not going to be doing it. It's a zoning bylaw. It's zoning bylaw, okay. Uh, could you give uh, a brief overview of what they're looking for and what you see are any problems? Yeah, so my general understanding of the proponent's goals here is to require 
uh, a further level of documentation uh, whenever the building inspector makes a zoning determination and the issuance of a building permit for the non-issuance of a building permit thereby requiring a special permit from the ARB or a variance from the ZBA. Uh, our position, the town's position has been that this information already exists. The issuance of a building permit is in of itself a statement that there is compliance with existing zoning and the denial uh, of the issuance of a building permit requiring either a variance or a special permit has an application process that goes along with it where each uh, part of why uh, zoning is not being complied with is laid out within that, build, uh, within that application that then goes on to either the ZBA or the ARB. We have concerns <clears throat> that if the building inspector was required to make uh, or create a further narrative document for every zoning determination that was made, uh, there would be a significant administrative burden that would require either the hiring of further inspectional help to perform the inspection work that the director is currently performing or hiring of additional administrative help to perform that additional administrative work <coughs> that the building inspector would have to do <coughs> creating these additional documents. So based on that, I, I think our general position is uh, you feel pretty strongly that this information is currently being generated. Uh, and I think additionally I'd add, should the CBA or ARB need additional information about a zoning determination made by the uh, building inspector? Uh, the building inspector has always been and will continue to be readily, readily available to them to answer questions or provide further information if they need it in making their decision. Okay, so uh, does anybody have any questions on the manager, Ken? No, but now this is really a money item. It gets right down to it. Because when I spoke with the building inspector, he felt that if he had to, in turn, do all his administrative paperwork, he definitely have to hire another building inspector because he does a lot of the building inspecting. He's out on, on the field. So if he's stuck out on the field, there's an inspector, and it could possibly uh, include, like you say, additional administrative staff. To me, that's wages. To me, that's money. Absolutely. So this is, abs to me, this is absolutely a money article. <coughs> absolutely. Does anybody have uh, also have questions, Alan? On the you know basis of it ain't broke, are you aware of any situation that this would fix? Is there anything broken that this might fix? I'm, I'm not aware of any situation. Anybody else? Okay, so there's the finance committee. Tom, Tom, oh, sorry, Tom. Tom, Tom, Tom. Oh, Tom. Oh, Tom. Sorry. If this thing should happen to go through, what would be, in your estimate, what what would be the expense? You know, so talking with the building inspector, uh, depending on what was actually put before town meeting by the proponent and then potentially adopted, uh, you know, the, the level of detail being required would have some impact. But I, I think somewhere between, you know, one and two FTEs could be possible, depending on what we're talking about. It, it's, it's not a problem up to date. Say that again. This is not a problem up to date. No, I, not, that, not, 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 not that it's ever been brought to my attention. Okay, so we can either let it go uh, let the redevelopment board, which they are doing, or we can take a vote to support the no action vote of the uh, redevelopment board. I move we support the take a uh, vote to support the no action of the redevelopment board. Second. 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 Is there any other discussion? Okay, uh, motion has been made and seconded to support the no action vote of the redevelopment board for the reasons that have been stated. Uh, all those, Peter? Oh, we haven't heard the proponent. I don't think I don't think we should vote on he it. Declined, uh, he, he declined. declined. He declined. Wasn't he here? He declined to come. Yeah. Actually, two things. He declined to come, and he did put forth a memo that I think was cert was uh, went out to all the uh, yeah. all the people. But he was, speci uh, um, Gloria specifically asked him, and he refused to come, and in which case, you know, I think the position of any of the reporting boards has always been no action. Uh, when? Yeah, I'm going to uh, vote against uh, the, rec the motion um, because I don't think it's a direct expenditure of funds. There's lots of things that town meeting does that could possibly, you know, relate result in additional funding needs in the future. So I, I, I kind of agree with with Chris that it's not really our position to vote on this. I'm going to I'm going to vote against it. Uh, James? Yeah, I was going to say I. I I, I support what Len said because I think um, we don't really know enough here. I mean, I think our position, so if I had to break down our position, is all new spending is bad new spending, period. I'm sorry. Our position here, if we voted, is all new spending is bad new spending because we really don't know enough about yeah. this article, right? So what I'm concerned about, if we're going to get on the floor of town meeting, we're going to find out something we don't know, and we're going to look really stupid. And I just, 
I, I agree with Len in the sense that we're not really being asked to vote on anything, and we're being asked to vote on incomplete information. I mean, even, I, I guess even if the redevelopment board, you know, I'm assuming they had a hearing on it, and if we at least knew what they heard at the hearing, we might be in a better sh position, but I think just voting it down seems to open us up to a weird position. Well, if you want to make an, an amended motion to not take a position on this article. I don't think we're informed enough to take it, a position on this article right but now. But if you like second it. I hate to drag this out even further, but it's, I mean, maybe the well, motion, motion, board should motion, chime in on this. You know, uh, we, we invited him back in early February. He refused to come, and he sent a memo uh, to us. I mean, I don't know what more. We can't drag him well, to maybe. it, but I think the position either you know, Ken's position is it's going to be a cost. We don't see a reason for it. We vote no. Or when and, and you, uh, it's not a direct appropriation. Therefore, there's no reason for us to take a position. That's, that's what we're going to vote on. Paul? I would say it's precisely because we don't have the information from the proponent that we should vote no action, that we, we don't want Yes, we don't know what he's going to bring to town meeting for a substitute motion, and so we should recommend no action at this point, because just because we, we can't make a judgment as to what it's going to cost. Okay, Grant. Well, last time we invited uh, Mr. Loretta, he uh, declined because he didn't think it was a financial impact, but maybe if it was pointed out to him there is a financial impact, he might reconsider, and then <coughs> have more information. Well, I, I, my guess is it's probably, no. did yeah. he appear before the redevelopment board? I believe he did. Okay. Um, other discussion, I mean, I, okay. Uh, Mary Margaret, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Charlie? Well, I, I, I think we've had information from the uh, department head and also from the town manager that there's a cost associated with this. So, um, and that it's addressing a problem that doesn't exist. So, I think there is a reason for the finance committee to take position. I, I agree, and Dean, I think this is, if this should ever go through, and I've done some research on it, in dealing with uh, inspectional services on a daily basis of what I do, there is no problem, and if this ever should slide through, because we've all seen things slide through town meeting on the 12th hour, this would be a costly way of where we're going to be sitting here looking for at least 150, 200,000. So I, I, I agree, I think we should take no action on this. Okay, is there anybody, any further discussion? Okay, all those, uh, all those in favor of supporting the no action vote of the redevelopment board, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Okay, all those in favor, please raise your hand. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Okay, and how many opposed? One, two, three, four, five. Now, here, here's a consideration. I'd almost ask the people to oppose it, to abstain or something, because. Um, you know, are you opposing it because you think we should do this, or are you opposing it because you think it's not a, uh, it's not a role of the finance committee, it's not a finance vote? If I could just ask, uh, Peter, yes or no? Uh, <laughs> yes or no? Well, I, yes, no I'm sorry. Are you, are you opposing it because you, you want more positions there, or do you want this to be done, or because you don't think it's a, uh, it's a role of the finance committee to deal with this? I don't understand it. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to question the vote, but I don't want, yeah, so it not, looked like five people are supporting doing this. No, I don't think so. The five people are saying we don't support the motion. Right. That's all yeah. it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. the motion, yeah. we don't support it. Or you can put in our reason, we don't support it because it's not a direct, because it's not a direct appropriation if you want. So okay, as, yeah. as a commentary, you can put that, but I'm Maybe not write a comment mind. and ask for, ask for review of the comment. See if everybody agrees with the comment. Yeah. Okay, I'll write up a comment. What I think's happening, if anybody of the five people who disagree disagree with that, you know, please let me know. Okay? Uh,
Okay, uh, Article 13 is the uh, disposition of real estate on uh, 1207 Mass Ave. So 1207 Mass Ave is the former DAV, Disabled American Veterans Hall. Uh, found out about two years ago based on some liquor license issues that it was actually owned by the town uh, under the Board of Selectmen. Uh, so uh, moving forward from there, the DAV was not able to retain its national licensure as a DAV club, so David moves out. The town has taken possession. Board of Selectmen went through a subcommittee process to look at options for reuse of the building. Uh, then held a public hearing where people were able uh, to come in and put forth ideas for what would be a good use for the building. So the Board of Selectmen's uh, chosen path is to very soon put it out to short-term lease uh, to try to uh, experiment basically with some of the ideas that the folks who came to the public hearing uh, had shared workspace uh, collaborative workspace for folks in town uh, but then also to ask for permission from town meeting to then eventually sell the building uh, so what we would be doing is putting out a lease probably for a short term a year maybe uh, 18 months uh, but then be looking to sell the building at the end of that lease. We want to get permission from town meeting this year. Proceeds of the lease, <clears throat> by law, proceeds of the sale of a capital asset have to go towards a capital asset, and proceeds from uh, a potential or expected sale are currently included in the capital budget for FY17, I believe. Okay, and the uh, Board of Selectmen has voted? Favorably to request uh, town meeting authorization to sell. Okay. It is, uh, Anybody have any questions? Tom? What's our cost by putting it up for lease? So we're drafting an RFP that really limits our cost. Uh, so very, very minor cost. We don't have to do anything to it. No, our, you know, so long as the building systems are working, we're not planning on making any improvements. So why, why hold it for 18 months, 12 months? So the, the idea really from the Board of Selectmen was there was a lot of folks who came out to that meeting uh, and there's been a lot of interest in talk in town about creating spaces for collaborative workspaces for people who either currently work from home or looking to get into some kind of startup or, or, or just work in such a space uh, and there was the thought of whether or not you know this space could be where it's tested to see if the concept works uh, come in maybe it does work maybe they buy the building maybe they don't uh, but really as the, the town giving an opportunity to be the first testing ground for that concept. So the lease would read that the person would rent it and do the build up. It would cost us? Yeah, any build up that was necessary, we would, that's what we'd be looking for. Anybody else have any other questions? Grant? Well, I like the uh, approach because it might be worth more once it's been proven some value with the leasing. I concur with that. Okay. Now, uh, so the selectmen are moving and they're going to recommend favorable action. Uh, I don't see that the Finance Committee needs to get involved when somebody wants to. Charlie? Uh, we need the money for this rent right school. <laughs> okay, so... So I would like to ask the uh, Finance Committee to support the selectmen of this because eventually, as, as uh, Adam said, it's going to be, if it gets sold, it's a capital asset, has to be used for capital asset and it'll help defray the cost of the uh, renovation of the Stratton School. Okay, you make a motion? I am making a motion to support the selectmen. And second. second. Okay, so support board of selectmen recommendation. Okay, is there any further discussion or questions? Dean? Are we gonna directly say that we support it in hopes that it's used to defray the cost of the Stratton School? Well, I think the sale, if it's the sale is, uh, it has to be used for capital asset, and then, then that would be with the capital budget committee. Yeah, I only bring it up because when we, I think we supported selling two. I know we supported selling two schools in the past for the purpose of rebuilding an elementary school. Oh, I think it would be this, the same. I mean, is it directly going to support? Yeah, it's going to be in the cap. Well, well, it'll be in the presentation I will give you for the next Monday night. Okay. 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 Motion has been made and seconded to support the recommendation of the board of selectmen. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, unanimous. Okay, uh, 14, disposition of real estate parcel. What is that? Cliff Avenue in Lexington. I guess we were just wanting to know what, what's this all about. So, uh, quick rundown. The Board of Selectmen voted no action on this at their last meeting on Monday night. 
Uh, this had its genesis in a uh, local attorney approached me, having a client who lives at the address here in Cliff Ave. A portion of that property is owned by the town. We own a great deal of uh, property that leads from this area of Lexington up into the Great Meadows. It was originally taken as water access rights. Uh, however, this portion of land that's a small triangle of about four or 5,000 square feet, uh, about half of it is this person's driveway and has their shed on it. Uh, they had an interest in buying the land uh, if the town was willing to release it. After some further investigation by <coughs> town council and his staff, we determined that based on the way it was acquired, uh, and some of the restrictions on the land, it wouldn't be advantageous for either us to give it up or for this property owner to try to acquire it. Uh, so we're recommending the election. Anybody want to finance committee to get involved? No. No. Okay. No. 14 no. is brushed off. <laughs> okay. Uh, complete streets program. Acceptance of legislation. <coughs> complete streets program. 16. This is uh, a new piece of law adopted, uh, adopted last year that would create something somewhat similar to the Green <coughs> Communities Division whereby when a community adopts certain criteria, <coughs> it would then become eligible if it met up with those criteria to receive grant funding for project implementation. So the first step in uh, Having access to that grant funding is adopting Section 90I, I believe it is, which is the Complete Streets Statute. Uh, you would then need to adopt a Complete Streets Policy, which can be done either by administrative policy or by law. Uh, <coughs> something the town already does, but doesn't necessarily have uh, an adopted policy. Uh, you then need to make sure that when you uh, design and build streets, they're in compliance with that policy. Uh, and you also have to set benchmarks uh, for uh, what kind of mode shift do you want to make over the next, I believe, five-year period? Mode shift being how many you know, people do you want to move from cars to walking to bike? Uh, the, the state has some very aggressive goals. The town wouldn't have to have such aggressive goals. <coughs> but uh, since we <coughs> basically uh, you know, comply with or right now do business uh, as a complete streets community, uh, we figured very appropriate to adopt the legislation and then have access to the grant funding that would be made available. Okay, so you're saying we already do what they require, therefore we might as well get the extra money. Correct. Okay, question, Charlie. What is the mode shift about? Mode shift is, is about m moving people uh, from one uh, one uh, type of, uh, what I'm looking for, I guess transit from another. So, you know, moving people out of a car onto a bike or a pedestrian. And what are we doing now to do that? I mean, uh, in other words, what does that have to do with building streets? And are we, um, what I'm really asking about is, are we either reducing the amount of parking available, are we increasing the cost of building the streets? What, what's the, what, are the, what are the background implications of this? So I think, you know, if you're talking about adding sidewalks or expanding sidewalks, yes, you might be expanding the cost. Uh, a lot of this is designing streets so that there's more pedestrian-friendly accommodations and bike-friendly accommodations, and potentially transit bus-friendly accommodations so that you can move people into using those accommodations more comfortably. So a, a lot of it's design and not necessarily hard infrastructure. There might be some projects in Arlington, maybe more in other communities in Arlington, where you're talking about actually building, like I said, a new sidewalk, where that, that would certainly have a, a cost factor. Um, I'm not sure that that's what we would be focusing on, though there are some areas that people today are requesting sidewalks. Uh, I would see this in Arlington much more of a, of a design guideline uh, than a new infrastructure. Carol? I'm assuming that one of the grants and, and probably one of the impetus for this is moving the bike lanes between the parked car and the sidewalk rather than the bike lane between the parked car and the driving car. Because I know there's a strong impetus among cyclists in town to have that shift happen at some point in time. I, I'm not sure what else it would be used for. I, I suspect that's a primary use, but I may be wrong. It could be used for raised crosswalks, more crosswalks, better pedestrian signalization uh, or notification for motors to know where there's a pedestrian crossing. Uh, there's a lot of different iterations that could fall under a complete street policy. Can we get more of the uh, countdown uh, crosswalks and the birds? Uh, something like that. <laughs> 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 oh, Longo drums. No, you know, well, you, you, you chuckle, but that, that those those chirps are very important for uh, disabled people who are using uh, using those signals to know when uh, the walks are located. Other questions from the committee? 
Okay, is the, I assume the selectmen is voting favorable? They have voted favorable. Okay, so the selectmen are moving ahead with this. Is this something the Finance Committee wants to get? No. Jump no, in? No. 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 Okay. 16 is gone. Okay. Collective bargaining. Now you've given us a memo. Um, okay, so it sounds like you have a couple of contracts set and you're working on the rest. Do um, you think you'd have additional information by April 13th? Uh, I think by April 13th we will have proposed votes for you in regards to the two contracts that we have previously fixed. Okay. Could you possibly have more contracts? Or of course you can. Yeah. A month? Potentially. Potentially. I wouldn't, I wouldn't commit to it, but potentially. Potentially. Okay. Uh, so if you could get uh, <coughs> April 13th is our last meeting. We're trying to wrap up everything. So if you could have votes to Gloria and also a vote to <coughs> set aside the rest of the money, you know, the standard yeah. where town meeting has to do it, uh, has to re-vote it before it can be used. Type of thing. Okay, so that's collective article. So that'll be April 13th. And if you could obviously email it out ahead of time, sure. that would be appreciated. Uh, Public Art, East Arlington. Could I ask for a deferral to a further meeting? I am still waiting for some information from the web. Okay, um, financing of that water and sewer articles. Grant, do you want to do that now or do you want to wait until you present the whole water and sewer budget? Uh, I actually had some questions to ask uh, Adam or Mike about. Um, may want to wait until. Okay, I that's fine. Uh, <coughs> or. Okay, uh, Human Rights Commission Executive Director. Uh, we, we heard a uh, presentation on this. Um, could you please tell us what's the status now of the Human Rights Commission Executive Director? So, de facto, for quite a while, the Health and Human Services Director has been acting as the Human Rights Commission's Executive Director. So, it's my intention at either the, the next uh, Board of Selectmen meeting or the following <coughs> meeting to request that the Board of Selectmen officially uh, take a vote to appoint the Health and Human Services Director as the Executive Director of the Human Rights Commission. Okay. Are you, are you, are you aware of uh, the proponent of this article's objection? That, that she's supposedly not qualified according to the original <coughs> article that established the Human Rights Commission. That's what he says. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't think I Well, that's, that's a heads up for you. Yeah. Okay. okay uh, now, this would be an appropriation article, so we need to take a position. I think we're waiting uh, to hear. Um, so, right now, the, uh, Christine has been uh, acting as for all intents and purposes. And there is funded administrative support under Christine's jurisdiction. Uh, so she has, she served in, in more of that supervisory capacity. There has been administrative support to the commission for some time. Um, and she meets regularly with that support. Okay. It does go to the meeting. <coughs> Is there any other questions, uh, so does Carolyn? She, does she currently consider that part of her job description, or would that include a stipend in the future? I, I don't think it would include us that in the future. Any other questions, uh, Charlie? So, so the, the Board of Selectmen is recommending against this article? Uh, the recommend? Board of Selectmen hasn't heard this article yet. Okay. What is your recommendation? <coughs> My recommendation is that um, the, the request is a, is a client. Actually, I, I don't know that the client is going to be because it's a client committee article, right? Yeah. So, um, but my recommendation is, as opposed to funding and hiring an independent executive director for the Human Rights Commission, uh, officially having the Board of Selectmen appoint the existing Health and Human Services Director as the executive director of the Human Rights Commission. Okay, do I have a motion on this article then? So moved. Uh, what's, what's no action? Sorry. <laughs> 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 I keep saying this. <laughs> 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 okay, I have a motion for no action. Second. 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 Any further discussion? Yeah, I, Adam, I would just emphasize what John said, which is when we were here at the hearing, we, we read the bylaw, and it has a very um, 
it's a very extensive criteria for what an executive director of this position should have for qualifications and, and things like that. So I, I do agree with John that I, you might, I caution that you might be trading one set of problems for another. That's fair. Stephen, yeah, just quick question. So, is it the next meeting of the board of selectmen that that it's going to be taken up, or? Yeah, I was looking at the twenty third, uh, but if it doesn't happen on the twenty third, okay. I would be following. I, I almost think, Alan, that this I wrote here is, is premature until if the position's filled by Christine, then there's no appropriation that's needed. But if it isn't filled, then they have to take it on step. Yeah, I'm not saying they do. Then maybe there is an appropriation that's appropriate. They, so I, I. I move to postpone the vote on it until the selectmen take action. Um, well, make the motion. I just did. Okay, is there a second, second to that? Second. second. Okay, moved and seconded to table until the selectmen take action. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Table. Uh, Okay, the, the Council on Aging and Transportation was the, uh, the last thing I have here. Um, and I think the, the issue simply come up that we'd sort of like to get in the background is that over the long term, this does not look like a viable enterprise fund. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's drawing down substantially on its fund balance. Uh, and if the fund balance is going to be gone in a couple of years. Uh, and so I think members wanted to say, well, you know, what, what do you see as the, as the long-term plan for the Council on Aging Transportation? Well, so we have been subsidizing Council on Aging Transportation, the general fund, for I think the past three or four years now with $30,000 a year. But we were doing so now in the face of them having more than 100% of their operating budget in reserve. Yeah. So this year's budget uh, proposal included reducing that operating subsidy to, to use a, a, a responsible or reasonable amount of that reserve down probably over the next two, maybe three years. Take 50, 25 percent of, of the actual operation and then consider uh, a general fund subsidy again to the Okay, because they've been drawing down. You're probably talking the range of $100, $120,000, if I remember correctly, uh, for a subsidy. Yeah, I think I, I think we mis, we mis, may have misread that. So they weren't really drawing down the fund; they were getting a larger subsidy than the thirty thousand. So they, they drew down in thirteen. They drew down fifty four thousand, and in fourteen they drew down about sixty eight, almost sixty nine thousand. Um, and they plan for 15 and 30, and, and so, so this money is disappearing. Uh, I'm just looking at the transfer from retained earnings. And they're getting another 40,000 from community development block grant money. So uh, the, the, the issue is, um, and this is, this is a presentation issue, transfer from retained earnings, um, that, that's both from the general fund and I believe. I know the 30,000 in the 15 budget is directly from the general fund, but it's 30,000 in 16 from retained earnings. So you say the, the 68,000 in fiscal 14 that just ended, that's not from retained earnings? I don't believe it is, no. No, code 4972 is a transfer from the general fund. It's just coded, it's just, yeah. the description is odd here. It's wrong. Okay. We can put uh, we get together, we'll, we'll get uh, the we together a memo to explain. Uh, okay, because right. that's what we were looking at. It says yeah. transfer from retained earnings. Yeah. And you can only transfer so much, so. Does anybody else have any questions on council on aging? Anybody send you that roof? I'm sorry? Well, I don't know. I was asked to do it um, by other people on the committee. Right. And I was, and you asked me, or somebody asked me to ask Ruth to do five years of revenue and expenditures, which I sent it. 
Okay. Uh, that's fine. Is there any other questions for the uh, for the manager? Okay. So meeting is on Monday. That'll be the uh, our capital program, uh, and we'll go on from there. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.